Good morning uh, and welcome to the 10th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. I see we all look bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. It's good to see you all. Um, we continue our consideration of the UK withdrawal from the Euro European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. And the first piece of business this morning, I call Amendment 115 in the name of Dean Lockhart, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Members will note from this grouping that there are a number of preemptions in this group, and I'll remind members of a preemption when I call the relevant amendment. Dean Lockhart to move Amendment 115 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning. Uh, in this grouping, I have one amendment in my own name, Amendment 115, and three amendments that I will be formally sub supporting, Amendments 9, 14, and 22. I will also talk to Amendments 11, 12, 13, 15, 119, 138, 206, and 212 in the name of other members. First of all, my Amendment 115 seeks to clarify the scope and application of Section 11 of the draft bill. As other members highlighted yesterday, Section 11 confers wide-ranging powers <coughs> to Scottish ministers to pass regulations in a number of areas without the approval of Parliament. Specifically, Section 11 empowers Scottish ministers to make such regulations as they consider appropriate in the following circumstances. Where ministers consider that there is or would be a failure of retained, devolved EU law to operate effectively, or any other deficiency in retained, devolved EU law arising from the withdrawal of the UK from the EU, and where it is necessary to make such provision for the purpose of preventing, remedying, or mitigating such failure or other deficiency. Convener, Section 11.5 provides that regulations to be made by ministers may make any provision that could be made by an Act of the Scottish Parliament. My Amendment 11.15 follows the concerns raised by the Law Society of Scotland over the scope and application of these powers. First of all, according to the Law Society, what constitutes a failure in the retained EU law to operate effectively, the provision I mentioned which is contained in Section 11.1, is not clear and is open to argument or subjective opinion despite the examples of deficiencies given in Section 11. And that's because, according to the Law Society, the deficiencies in Section 11 are neither exhaustive nor limited to deficiencies of the same kind, making it very difficult to interpret. Secondly, the Law Society goes on to explain that Section 11.11 of the Bill adds further uncertainty. Section 11.11 uh, broadens the category of deficiency that ministers may address by providing that a failure or other deficiency arising from the withdrawal of the UK from the EU includes a reference to any failure or other deficiency arising from that withdrawal taken together with the operation of any other provision or the interaction between any provision made by or under this Act. Convener, the operation and scope of this section is unclear. To address these concerns, my Amendment 115 proposes to insert a new subsection into the draft bill which would provide as follows. Scottish ministers must, by regulations, subject to the affirmative procedure, define what, for the purposes of the Act, constitutes a failure of retained devolved EU law to operate effectively. The purpose of my Amendment 115 is threefold. To introduce further legal certainty as to the scope and operation of the powers conferred upon ministers. To introduce further legal certainty as to what would constitute a failure of retained devolved EU law to operate effectively and thirdly, to introduce parliamentary scrutiny to the exercise of these powers by ministers. In his remarks at the end of this grouping, I would invite the minister to address these concerns of the Law Society on the powers being conferred upon ministers in this section, which can be used and uh, implemented without scrutiny of parliament. I, I would also ask the minister to provide examples of what he might consider as a failure of retained devolved EU law to operate effectively. Convener, moving on to the three amendments that I am formally supporting uh, in the name of other members, Amendments 9, 14 and 22. These amendments propose to change the test applied for the use of the powers by ministers to pass the regulations I have mentioned. As currently drafted, ministers would be able to make such provision using these regulations as they consider 
appropriate to deal with deficiencies arising from UK withdrawal of the, from the EU. The key words here being, as ministers consider appropriate. However, amendments 9, 14 and 22 would change this test so that ministers are only able to make such provision by regulation as is necessary to deal with def deficiencies arising from the e UK withdrawal from the EU. Again, these amendments are made to address concerns raised by the Law Society that the legislation as currently drafted would allow ministers to make provisions in whatever manner they consider appropriate, which is a subjective test and one that would be wide ranging. To address this issue, the Law Society has suggested an amendment that Scottish ministers should only make such regulations as are necessary, which is a, an objective test, rather than appropriate, which is the subjective test. Convener, amendments 11, 12, 13, 15, 119, 206 and 212 in the name of other members are based on a similar rationale. They all change the existing uh, tests uh, set out by reference to the subjective test or of, of appropriate to the more objective test of necessary in the relevant parts of section 11. And I, in my uh, winding up remarks, I would like to address those uh, uh, proposed amendments in more detail. But for the time being, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Uh, Neil Bibby to speak to Amendment 116 and other amendments in the group. Uh, good, good morning, Kavina. Um As Dean Lockhart has said, there are multiple instances uh, throughout Part 3 of this bill where um, Scottish ministers could be permitted to exercise significant regulation-making powers. These powers are far-reaching and can be considered where the minis Scottish ministers consider appropriate. My concern, and the concern of many others, is that this bill, as it presently drafted, places too much power in the hands of the Scottish Government and not enough power in the hands of of the Parliament. Um, amendments 116 to 119, 124 and 135 to 138 in this group in my name are an attempt to dr address those concerns. Instead of mandating the Scottish Government to use regulation making powers when ministers consider it appropriate, the Scottish Government will be mandated to use regulation making powers where necessary. This is not just a focus of uh, my amendments in this group, uh, but also uh, the amendments of other members uh, Tavis Scott, uh, from Tavis Scott, supported by Neil Finlay uh, and from uh, Dean Lockhart. This bill has to be tested. The requirement for ministers to use the powers granted to them by this bill has to be tested. Uh, this is what um, these amendments uh, and a number of amendments from uh, colleagues across the chamber seek to do. The bill should not permit the use of these regulation-making powers where it is not necessary. Two of my amendments, 119 and 138, resemble very closely amendments 9 and 22 in the name of Neil Finlay. These amendments were lodged separately but would have uh, a similar effect, and James Kelly will speak to uh, those uh, amendments. It is necessary to adapt retained EU law so that it functions in Scotland on and after exit day and it is necessary to confer new powers on Scottish ministers to manage that transition. This bill, however, must not marginalise the Scottish Parliament and it must not be a vehicle for bypassing the Scottish Parliament. The powers available to ministers must, must therefore be limited to converting EU law into Scots law and must not extend any further unchecked and without proper scrutiny. Um, I therefore uh, hope members will consider supporting uh, the amendments in my name in this group. Thank you. James Kelly to speak to Amendment 9 and other amendments in the group. Okay, thank you, Convener. I, I move amendments, uh, or I speak to Amendments 9, 14 and 22 uh, in the name of uh, Neil Finlay, and I, uh, I'm going to be moving them in the, the name of my colleague. Um, these uh, amendments essentially replace the, the wording uh, in three sections. Uh, and they make the wording tighter and provide more clarity um, by uh, re replacing the wording as they consider appropriate with uh, the wording necessary. And I think this provides tighter wording, provides greater legal clarity and uh, is, is more concise in terms of the regulation powers and ties in with points that Neil Bibby uh, was indeed making. 
In terms of the other amendments in the group, I want to indicate support for Neil Bibby's amendments and also Tavish Scott's amendment. Thank you. Tavish Scott to speak to Amendment 9 and other, sorry, 10 and other amendments in the group. Uh, good morning, Convener. Thank you. Um, amendment 10 is one of a series of amendments uh, that seek to restrict the use of ministerial room for manoeuvre establishing, in establishing new regulations. And in the spirit of the remarks from Dean Lockhart, um, James Kelly and Neil Bibby, uh, I would uh, move those in that basis. The addition of the words on reasonable grounds in Amendment 10 and Amendment 16 will toughen the tests, making them judiciable and narrow ministerial discretion. Amendments 11, 12, 13 and 15 seek to toughen the test for ministerial uh, action and given the areas that we are in, that seems uh, uh, an appropriate course of action. Now, I certainly accept that the Minister has earlier explained that a test of necessary has been placed in Section 111B, which has to be met before appropriate provisions can be proposed by Ministers. That debate, of course, is the one that uh, has just been spoken to in relation to uh, Mr Kelly. My amendment seeks to place a test of necessary onto all of the deficiencies referred to in the bill in section 11 to C, D, E, F and G. I want to restrain the room for, room for, for ministerial manoeuvre without recourse to Parliament. Ministers will have to make the case before they can use these extensive new powers and their remedy is necessary. That seems uh, a fair uh, test. The only other observation I'd make uh, convener is that Amendment 9 uh, seems to me where uh, members don't accept that there is a test of necessary in 111B before ministers can consider any appropriate action. I've said that I accept the necessary test has been put there and I have an amendment later to make sure that ministers have to report how that test has been met, which again seems to be an important check in the system and I move on that basis. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 134 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I will uh, take my amendment first, as I think uh, the other amendments are similarly themed. Uh, mine perhaps stands out somewhat uh, slightly differently. Um, what I'm seeking to achieve uh, uh, in Amendment 134 and how it differs from Neil Baby's Amendment 135 is I think Neil Baby's Amendment is heading in the right direction uh, uh, in terms of the wording, but I would like to go further with mine. The current uh, section 12, uh, uh, sub subsection 1, um, in my view, is, is worrying. Uh, the proposal as it is in the bill seems to imply that the method for identifying a breach or what is or even what might be a breach of the United Kingdom's international obligations arising from a, a withdrawal from the EU lies subjectively with the Scottish Government. Uh, from my understanding, this clause could be used by Scottish ministers uh, to introduce or change regulations as they see fit to ensure that interna international obligations are met. Now, I'm sure I can't be the only MSP who'd be concerned about adding this power to the Scottish Government, which would, in effect, undermine the independence of not just our, but any judiciary system by adding an overtly political element to it. I do not believe that it is for the Scottish Government to be making decisions on another government's international obligations, nor do I believe it's the Scottish Government's uh, position uh, to decide which treaties uh, that the UK government is or is not adhering to. International treaties are enforced by the relevant courts, domestic or otherwise. Let me give you an example. The European Commission is legally defined as the guardian of the treaties, but as the executive branch of the EU, they still need to refer cases to the European Court of Justice or the Court of First Instance and are bound by judgments thereof. My amendment places the responsibility of identifying breaches of treaties on relevant courts rather than ministers. My amendment allows Scottish ministers, however, to make provisions that they see appropriate for dealing with such breaches as they have been identified by courts. So the new phrasing uh, mirrors the current practice in the uh, tripartite relationship that exists between the UK Supreme Court, uh, the UK Parliament, uh, and its, uh, uh, its adherence to the Human Rights Act of 1998 where, for example, the Supreme Court could issue a declaration of incompatibility when it finds an act uh, of Parliament is incompatible with the Human Rights Act, and the, the UK Parliament would then make necessary changes to ensure that the act is compatible. Uh, my amendment would enshrine to law that any dispute must be brought before the relevant court responsible for enforcing international obligations. All I'm proposing this morning is that we do not deviate from international practice 
in adding additional powers onto the Scottish Government. I'd like to turn some of the other amendments uh, in this group. Uh, I fully support Amendment 115 uh, in the name of Dean Lockhart uh, for the two reasons that he outlined. One is that it provides additional legal certainty, and the, third, uh, the second is that it, uh, it uh, will also in, uh, increase the ability of Parliament uh, uh, to scrutinise via the affirmative procedure. Um, many of the other amendments in this grouping, uh, as those uh, laid out by Labour, um, are also uh, welcome in my view. Um, again, they add more uh, uh, objectivity. Uh, uh, the words the Scottish ministers consider is used throughout this bill, and I think it's not just the MSPs or uh, political views that they should be replaced, uh, but we have had evidence from the Law Society as such. And I think that evidence uh, should be taken into account uh, throughout. Uh, those are my only comments in that grouping. Thank you. Thank you. Liam Kerr to speak to Amendment 206 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, <coughs> Convener. Uh, Section 31B sets out a sweeping provision that any power to make regulations that are incidental, supplementary, consequential, transitional, transit, transitory, or saving are allowed, as ministers consider appropriate. Section 32 repeats that form of words in a mopping up section that gives broad powers of regulation, and again, it is expressed to be where ministers consider it appropriate. That is too broad. As drafted, this gives the Scottish ministers powers to make legislation as appropriate, which is subjective. I listened to Dean Lockhart praying the Law Society in aid and seeking to interpose the objective test of necessary, and I associate myself with the, his remarks in this regard, and I, I think they apply equally to my amendments. I also recognise Neil Bibby's comments about placing too much power in the hands of Scottish ministers by use of the word appropriate. This bill should not permit the use of such powers where it is not necessary. Uh, regulations in this case then should only be brought where they are required. My amendments change to, uh, to, to that, to, to tighten the definition and place the necessary checks on executive power. Now in anticipation of ministerial response, this is of course going further than the withdrawal bill and this is entirely appropriate. We are a single chamber. The House of Lords brings an extra level of scrutiny to regulations in Westminster. Our particular setup means we have to be particularly cautious about extensions of executive power. That's what these amendments 206 and 212 seek to do, and I hope the committee will look favourably upon those amendments. Thank you. We now move to any other committee member wishing to speak. Adam Tomkins. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to um, speak briefly, if I may, convener, to the um, amendments in, in this group in the name of um, opposition members who are not uh, um, Scottish Conservatives. Obviously, the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the Scottish Conservative amendments. Um, but it, we will also um, be supporting all of the other opposition amendments in the names of Neil Bibby, uh, uh, Tavish Scott, um, uh, and uh, Neil Findlay in this um, group for two reasons, principally, uh, convener. First, that um, amendments 116, 117, 118, uh, all in the name of Neil Bibby, uh, 124 in the name of Neil Bibby, 10 and 16 in the name of Tavish Scott, um, and also 135, 136, 137, all in the name of Neil Bibby. All of these amendments have the same effect, um, and that is to say that they have the effect of reducing excessive ministerial discretion. Um, now, the Minister is fond of reminding um, the Parliament that we must be careful with our language, and yet at the same time he constantly uses the uh, unnecessary and um, hyperbolic rhetoric of power grab when he describes the uh, withdrawal bill. Um, there is a power grab uh, in this legislation too. It isn't a power grab from Westminster to Holyrood or the other way around, but it is a power grab from Parliament to Executive. And we must be equally alive to the appropriate balance of power between the Executive branch and the legislature, as we must be to the uh, devolution settlement. If we are to respect the Constitution, um, uh, then we need to be alive to the issues of separation of powers, uh, as well as to um, uh, devolution uh, and its appropriate uh, settlement. This is an element of the rule of law, which Gordon Lindhurst spoke eloquently about uh, yesterday evening. And so for that reason, 
um, uh, uh, convener, um, the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the amendments that I've just named, that they reduce excessive ministerial discretion. Um, the uh, second, uh, as it were, kind of subgroup um, of amendments in this group um, are amendments that delete the word appropriate and re replace it with the word necessary in a number of uh, different uh, provisions, principally in section uh, 11 uh, and uh, 12 and 30, as Liam Kerr has just, and 32, as Liam Kerr has just spoken about. Now, again, the minister has made great play of the fact that one of the significant differences, in his view, between the withdrawal bill at Westminster and the continuity bill here um, is that ministerial powers here can only be exercised where necessary, whereas ministerial powers in Westminster can be exercised where appropriate. And the minister has made great play of this. We're just encouraging him. Uh, to be through our support of these opposition amendments to be consistent rather than as he currently is inconsistent about this um, and for the reason that the very important again constitutionally important reason that was outlined a few minutes ago by Liam Kerr which is to say that you know we have to recognize that this is a unicameral parliament it's not a bicameral parliament it's not like Westminster the constitutional function of the House of Lords is to act as a check on that which happens in the House of Commons we have no equivalent uh, in uh, Scotland. This is a unicameral legislature. Therefore, we have to be even more alert than our friends and colleagues in Westminster have to be about ensuring that ministerial discretion is appropriately tailored. Um, and for that reason, we will be supporting all of the amendments that seek to remove the word appropriate from this bill and replace it with the word necessary. Thank you. Good. Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, slightly uh, uncomfortable suggesting that I, I might have reached the same conclusion as Adam Tom Com Tompkins, but for very different reasons. Uh, it does strike me as odd that he spent uh, a good part of yesterday evening telling us that the most important thing was to have consistency uh, with the UK legislation, and now he's telling us that the minister should have consistency with his own arguments rather than uh, with uh, those being made down south. Um, for very different reasons, uh, I'm not someone who thinks that we should be uh, following in lockstep with the UK legislation. I'm judging this on its own terms, and it does seem to me that from my perspective there is uh, a good case for replacing the word uh, appropriate with the word necessary. Um, I would like to ask the Minister, when he's responding to this group, to be very clear to separate the different arguments. Uh, it seems to me there is a case for replacing necessary with appropriate, on the other amendments which seek to uh, remove the uh, role of ministers in reaching a view uh, about what they consider uh, should be done uh, and instead uh, applying an objective test, I think I have more concerns. Uh, it's not clear to me who would uh, assess that objective test, who would be determining that objective test. Um, and we've seen in the, the debate over the continuity bill itself uh, that in a great deal of, uh, uh, of this whole situation, there is uh, what we've had described to us as room for difference of opinion, room for disagreement uh, on questions uh, such as the competence of the, uh, of the continuity bill. Um, I, I would like to ensure that we avoid the situation where ministers reach the view that regulations are necessary and must be brought to parliament uh, and they're unable to do so or that the issue becomes mired in a question about whether an objective test that hasn't been well defined in the legislation has or has not been met and whether in fact they therefore have the legal right even to lay those regulations before parliament there are really important discussions to have later about the level of scrutiny that regulations will have uh, and i think there should be uh, i hope a degree of cross-party support for beefing that system up a bit and making sure that Parliament is in control of the level of scrutiny it wishes to provide uh, and, uh, 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 and, and can uh, hold to account the significant powers which ministers are, uh, are to acquire under this bill if it, if it passes. But I would be very concerned if we leave ourselves in a position where we're simply unable to debate, unable to begin scrutiny of uh, something because legal doubt has been raised over whether ministers have the right to lay a resolution uh, for discussion uh, because of some objective test that, that doesn't appear to be well defined. So just asking the Minister to respond separately to those points, one on the question of necessary and appropriate uh, and, and the other on this question of uh, ministerial 
uh, consider, the, the, whether ministers have the power to consider uh, as the, the, the trigger for laying a, an instrument. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Yeah, I think um, amendments 11 to 15 from Tavish Scott and uh, Neil Finlay could actually make it almost impossible to exercise the, the powers in question here. It seems reasonable to me to retain the word appropriate rather than replacing it with a specific requirement to establish necessity. I can imagine a number of situations where, where it might not be so clear what a particular policy direction might actually be. And so I think it's better to allow some flexibility to be applied here. So in my view, the, the amendments could actually weaken the bill at best and potentially make it inoperable, at least in some circumstances, at worst. And rather than being an example of excessive discretion being applied, it seems to me, as mindful of Patrick Harvey's comments there, it seems like an example of excessive inconsistency when we're talking about this bill and its comparison with the UK Parliament. No other members indicate they want to speak. Minister. Thank you. And this uh, <coughs> section is appropriate. We come to it first thing in the morning because the issue of proper scrutiny and the issue of the way in which ministerial power can be exercised um, or restrained is crucial to the consideration of a whole range of, of issues that we're going to be taking forward uh, this morning. And I want at the outset to indicate that I am aware of that. And I am absolutely aware of the issue of ensuring that anything that is done under this bill is done in a way that has maximum scrutiny and also that ministers are placed in the position that they are aware of the special powers that this bill gives. But we have to ask why this bill gives special powers. It is because of the circumstances created by the United Kingdom's Brexit process. That is why those powers exist in the withdrawal bill, because there is a very major job of work to be done, uh, and that job of work cannot be done by the tools that are presently to hand. So if we're devising new tools to undertake this, then those tools have to be appropriate or necessary, certainly, but they have to be able to be scrutinized and they have to be able to be trusted. Now, what we have done, and I'll come on to this in a moment, what we have done is look carefully at what the situation is in the UK bill and strengthen the powers of this parliament compared to the way that these are overseen, scrutinized, controlled by the Westminster parliament. I am pleased at that inconsistency in Patrick Harvey's terms because the inconsistency is we have been listening and we continue to listen. And I want to make a general point that will apply to this and to subsequent parts of the debate this morning. I will be accepting a range of amendments that do just that. But I won't be accepting all the amendments for reasons that I will give about those amendments. So I am not resisting the principle in any sense of making sure that there is stronger scrutiny, that there are more restraints on ministerial power. But that does not equate to accepting every single proposal, some of which are either inoperable or would be difficult to operate. Uh, I don't think we should be in lockstep with Westminster. I've always believed we should do better than Westminster if we possibly can, and that is what we are going to try and do. I would also just point out to Patrick Harvey, the, the central problem in legislation is, of course, the way in which objective tests are then enforced or scrutinized. There is no way around that. If the piece of legislation has an objective test and the objective test is not met, then redress exists through the courts. That is the legal situation that we have. But outlining the objective test and making sure that it is applied and can be scrutinized very closely by the chamber is exactly what we should be doing, and that's what we are trying to do. So I believe the test should be toughened. I'm going to try and find ways to toughen them in this and subsequent sections, but I stress it's not possible to, to accept all the amendments in that regard, and therefore when I accept some, I'm not doing it on the basis of favoritism, I'm doing it on the basis of practicality and striking that balance between scrutiny and between control and the, the issue of getting the job done. Let me therefore, uh, convener, start with Dean Lockett's Amendment 115 by requiring regulations to define a failure of EU retained law to operate effectively arising from EU withdrawal, it would require an intervening set of further regulations to be made and complicate the already difficult process of adjusting domestic law to Brexit. Uh, I have to say, convener, that those people who are now supporting Brexit but are actually intending to make it even more difficult for the Scottish Parliament to adjust to it really need to consider their position. It would delegate more power to ministers, which has been criticised elsewhere. And while failures of EU law to operate effectively may be a relatively wide concept, 
The power here is limited by the context of EU withdrawal. It's also limited by the test of whether it's a necessity to make provision, prevent, remedy, or mitigate the failure which we have added to the bill, and that's another safeguard. Now, Neil Bibby's amendments 116 to 119, 124, and 135 to 138, and 138 would adjust the main legal test for what deficiencies can be remedied and how international obligations can be implemented. They would remove references to ministerial judgment of whether the law fails to operate properly or whether there's another deficiency or breach of international obligations so that only provision objectively necessary would be permitted. Now, I'm sympathetic, but actually, sections 111B and 121B already make careful provision to require that it is necessary, and I stress the word, it's in the legislation, necessary to make provision in order to prevent, remedy, or mitigate the failure of deficiency. However, it allows sensible and practical appropriate solutions to be made without the need to ensure that they are also absolutely necessary. Now, in that context, the test would be unclear because we've been applying it twice in different circumstances. It would actually lead a lot to the working out of the courts. Necessary is there in sections 111B and 121B, and there is an objective test. Now, that issue runs through many of the amendments, and we're drawing the boundary carefully because we're drawing on the House of Lords Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee report, which we accepted and have implemented, and talking about consistency, uh, the Commons has not, and we're also relying on specific recommendations com of committees here in Holyrood in going further than the UK bill. Now, that same issue applies to Amendment 9 from Neil Finlay. Uh, I'm sympathetic, but the same reason of enabling sensible and practical provision to be made in the midst of what is a Brexit crisis. Uh, if we go further than we already have, then the ability to deal with that crisis becomes diminished, and there is a judgment to be made. And that judgment, is, if it is made by ministers, is subject both to the bill and to the chamber and to the legal process, and they're all in there. And a related point is Amendment 11 to 15 from Tavish Scott to replace necessary for appropriate in the detailed heads of what is a deficiency in describing EU arrangements or structures no longer relevant as a consequence of leaving the EU. Now that sounds apt in the context of the UK leaving the EU, but it may actually, and this is a key point, be necessary to retain some of these structures or arrangements, but just not appropriate to, remain, to, to retain the existing structures or arrangements and the intention is to have this power available to vary, to adapt the structures to new circumstances. If we use necessity, then we may find ourselves unable to do so. By contrast, however, I'm happy to support Tavish Scott's Amendments 10 and 16, providing that ministers must have reasonable grounds to consider that various matters apply in what is listed as a deficiency. Uh, I think that does help to clarify where we might be and where we're going. I can't accept Amendment 134 from Jamie Green, requiring a court to identify a breach of a UK international obligation before Section 12 regulations can be made rather than leaving it to ministers. I believe his interpretation of the bill is wrong. Uh, and the power is actually being exercised in the same way as in the UK. And the massive criticism he made of exercising the power would have to apply to the UK as well. We've actually put additional safeguards in. Primary legislation would actually have to be made in, this, in these circumstances to avoid a breach, and that would greatly reduce the utility of the power in the special circumstances of Brexit. Nor can I support amendments 206 and 212 from Lee and Kerr to adjust the powers to make incidental, supplementary, consequential, or transitional provision in regulations so that ministers must consider provision necessary. The normal formulation where such provisions are included in a normal bill would be to allow such provision where appropriate or expedient as well. This change would limit the provision that could be made in regulations and in the ancillary power of the bill to less than the standard latitude even for a normal ancillary power, especially for a bill of this nature where it would be important to have wider ancillary powers available given the range of the material the bill may have to cover. It would greatly harm the practical flexibility of those powers to cover any eventualities if such a power was unavailable. Indeed, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in their report on the withdrawal bill raised no issues with the equivalent power in that bill, which uses an appropriateness test and indeed suggested that the Scottish Minister should be given a similar power in the bill. So to conclude, Convener, my, my position is this. I, I'm happy to accept the two amendments. I've indicated 10 and 16. I've indicated it will be my intention to accept further amendments on scrutiny and other similar powers, but I can't accept every amendment because what many of the amendments would do would either, not, would either restrict the bill unduly or would create the circumstances where the 
requirement of the bill is undermined in a way which makes it impossible to meet the ful fulfill the obligations of the bill to actually make these changes which are being forced upon us. We've tried very hard to ensure that we improve this, the, these parts of the bill compared to the UK bill. We will continue to do so, as I indicate, uh, and I hope members will therefore accept that we are uh, moving in the right direction and navigating a careful course between a whole range of competing demands. Thank you. Um, Dean Lockhart to wind up. Uh, thank you, convener. I would like to make three general points in winding up before uh, turning to the uh, minister's response to the uh, amendments. Uh, first of all, uh, my uh, first point relates to scrutiny, uh, a point raised by a number of members. Uh, the debate surrounding Section 11 powers, I think, is an important example of the fundamental concerns members have expressed uh, with respect to the level of scrutiny this chamber has been afforded uh, with respect to this legislation. The amendments uh, in this grouping uh, were largely, or, or many of them were suggested by the Law Society of Scotland in their submission on the draft legislation. If the Minister is unable to accept comments made by uh, the Law Society of Scotland with regard to legal certainty, with regard to tests applicable to the use of wide-ranging ministerial power, and provide a full explanation as to why uh, those uh, recommendations and amendments cannot be accepted, then we do have real concerns about how this legislation will uh, work in practice. Uh, the Minister acknowledged that the Bill gives Ministers, uh, in his words, special powers. Um, if that is the case, then I would emphasise all the more the need for proper and full scrutiny of this legislation. Um, I, I accept the Minister is listening uh, to uh, members, but the process itself is uh, very short and there is not a long time for a listening exercise. The second point I would make, second general point I would make, is that um, these amendments uh, proposed are designed to address what Adam Tompkins uh, referred to as a power grab by ministers under Section 11. We have heard cross party consensus uh, during um, these amendments being proposed. Uh, on these concerns about a power grab uh, from Neil Bibby, James Kelly, Tavish Scott, as well as colleagues from my party. I think it's worth reflecting on some of these comments. Uh, Neil Bibby said that this bill, quite rightly, should not be a vehicle for bypassing the Scottish Parliament. Tavish Scott uh, highlighted that these amendments uh, will act as an appropriate check on wide-ranging powers that would otherwise be conferred on ministers. And Liam Kerr highlighted his concerns uh, surrounding um, the extent and wide-ranging nature of, uh, of these powers. Uh, the third point I would make is in relation to the overreach in Section 12.1. Uh, like Jamie Green, I'm also worried about the current wording in this section and how this may impact international treaties that the UK is party to. Uh, the amendment sub submitted by Jamie Green highlights uh, inter alia uh, the critical role played by the judicial system in the interpretation of international treaties. And again, it is uh, somewhat disappointing that the minister wasn't able to um, accept the amendment proposed, Amendment 134. Turning to the specific um, amendments proposed and the uh, response from the minister, the minister acknowledged, um, as I mentioned, that the bill confers uh, special powers. And if it does confer special powers, then I think uh, some of these am amendments are designed uh, to um, specify how these special powers will work. And it's disappointing the Minister is not able to accept my amendment uh, 115, as this is designed to address concerns raised by the Law Society of Scotland precisely on that point, uh, precisely on the issue of how these special powers will be uh, exercised by the Minister. So if there is, on the one hand, special powers uh, being conferred by this legislation, then I think uh, there is also a case to be made for special uh, provisions that will define and regulate how these powers will be uh, operated and uh, enforced by ministers, especially if this is outside the scrutiny of Parliament. Uh, it is likewise disappointing the minister uh, proposes to retain the use of the subjective test of appropriate in a number of uh, areas and not the, subject, not the objective test uh, proposed by the Law Society in their submission. Uh, convener, to conclude, uh, the Minister, I think, agreed to two amendments uh, 
proposed, but has suggested that others may be accepted under further consideration. But my question, I think, and this relates not only to this grouping, but to others, is that do we really have time to discuss and review and vote on a further iteration of uh, amendments on uh, uh, submissions uh, made not only by members, but by stakeholders and a number of experts. And that perhaps is a question that we can come back to uh, uh, when we discuss later groupings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the question is that Amendment 115 be agreed to, or we all agreed? Here's a phrase I've not heard for a while, there will be a division. So all those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 115, we're five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Call Amendment 116, the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 115. Neil Bibby, to move or not move? Move. <coughs> the question, therefore, is that Amendment 116 be agreed to, or we all agreed? Yes. In that case, there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. <clears throat> On Amendment 116, we're five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 116 in the name of Neil, sorry, 117 in the name of Neil Bibby. I already debated with Amendment 115. Neil Bibby to move or not move? move. <clears throat> the question is that Amendment 117 be agreed to. Are all agreed? No. There will be division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 117, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 118 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 115. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. <coughs> the question is, Amendment 118 be agreed or we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. Uh, all those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 118, there are five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 119 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 115. And I remind members that if Amendment 119 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 9 because there's preemption. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. The question is that 119 be agreed, are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 119, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Now call Amendment 9 in the name of Neil Findlay, already debated with... Amendment 115, James Kelly, to move or not move? Move. The question is, Amendment 9 be agreed, are we all agreed? There will be a division. Um, those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hand. <clears throat> On Amendment 9, there were four, five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 120 in the name of Adam Tompkins, grouped with Amendments 121, 122, 123, 148, 150, 151, 152, 153 and 154. Adam Tompkins to move Amendment 120 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 120 in my name. Um, uh, Convener, these amendments in my name in this group are probing amendments. I do not intend to press them at stage two, but I do intend to revisit the substance of the matter at stage three. Um, the um, uh, amendments um, seek uh, to, um, if I can put it like this, square the circle um, between um, uh, the uh, demands uh, of the devolution settlement, the requirements of the devolution settlement on the one hand, um, and the Scottish Conservatives have ever since the publication of the Withdrawal Bill, um, been consistently of the view um, that the Withdrawal Bill, as introduced into the House of Commons, 
does not respect the devolution settlement and needs to be amended. We uh, signed up unanimously to the committee's report that clause 11 of the withdrawal bill needs to be <coughs> removed or replaced. Those are strong words um, and we meant them. Um, I'm sure every member of the committee did. Um, but we have also um, been uh, four square behind the United Kingdom government um, in insisting uh, that Brexit does not inadvertently or indeed deliberately lead uh, to the breakup of the United Kingdom uh, or to the uh, disintegration of the UK's domestic market. Um, uh, and uh, these are uh, competing legitimate demands um, from the UK government on the one hand and indeed the Welsh government um, uh, and the uh, Scottish government on the other, um, both of which it seems to us and has always seemed to us need to be satisfied uh, in legislating for the United Kingdom's smooth uh, withdrawal uh, from the uh, European Union. Now, we know that there has been uh, a, a, you know, a, several months uh, of negotiations between the UK government and the Scottish and Welsh governments and the Northern Irish executive um, on this issue um, uh, for uh, ever since last summer. And we also know that there is another round of that negotiation today when the First Minister meets the Prime Minister in London uh, this afternoon. We, we know that uh, those negotiations have made significant and substantial progress. Uh, we know that um, at Clause 11 of the Withdrawal Bill has now, uh, well, that the, that the United Kingdom government has now tabled uh, an amendment to Clause 11 uh, of uh, the uh, Withdrawal Bill, which goes some distance towards, some very considerable distance towards satisfying the requirements of the Scottish and Welsh governments and uh, indeed satisfying the requirements of uh, the Finance and Constitution Committee's recommendations in its interim report. Um, it doesn't go all of the way. Um, the deal is not yet done, but progress has been significant. Progress at the same time has been significant in what um, others have coined, uh, this is not a phrase I particularly like, but others have coined the deep dive, uh, the examination of the issues uh, where there is going to be the need um, for some sort of legislative or non-legislative uh, common framework across Great Britain or across the whole of the United Kingdom um, to ensure um, that powers uh, that are exercised by governments at all levels, including ministers of the Crown, um, are not exercised in a manner um, that is inconsistent either with the constitutional arrangements of the United Kingdom, of the devolved United Kingdom, or with the um, uh, imperative uh, that the integrity of the United Kingdom's domestic market is not unduly disrupted um, by the Brexit process. Now, in all of that, there has been very significant agreement right across the political parties represented in this chamber. There's been very significant agreement between the Scottish Conservatives and the Scottish Government. Um, and there are um, it, a number of issues raised in the letter to all MSPs written by uh, the Minister, Mr. Russell, uh, two days ago on the 12th of March, um, with which um, we continue to uh, agree and indeed welcome. So, for example, uh, Mr. Russell says that the Scottish Government has consistently made clear that we, as to say the Scottish Government, are not opposed to common frameworks where these are in the best interests of Scotland and are ready to work with the UK Government to agree where these may be required. Well, I unambiguously welcome that. I thank Mr Russell for saying it. He said it many times. Um, I think that it's uh, very welcome that the Scottish Government has recognised throughout this entire process that there is a need for UK common uh, frameworks. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, the, um, uh, Mr. Russell says in his, uh, in his letter that one of the challenges um, with the uh, amendment that has been tabled in the House of Lords in the government's name uh, to uh, Clause 11 of the Withdrawal Bill um, is that it does not specify or seek to specify the areas with regard to which there is going to be a need to ensure um, that repatriated powers are not exercised in a manner that could threaten the integrity of the United Kingdom's domestic market. Now, it is my view, and candidly, convener, it has always been my view that it would be in the interests of both governments and in the interests of the United Kingdom um, for the withdrawal bill to specify the areas where there is likely to be a need for a common framework. I have always been of the view, and I continue to be of the view, that it would be in the public interest, it would be in all of our interests, for that to be not just on the record, 
which it now is, thanks to the um, uh, disclosures this week from the, or last week from the uh, Cabinet Office, but on the face of primary legislation. Um, and that is what um, the, my amendments in this group seek to do. What they seek to do is, in a sense, to cut through, and I hope, we're very interested to see what the Minister has to say about this in due course, to cut through and I hope solve the current impasse, as I understand it, between the UK government and the Scottish government on the consult slash consent issue. Because they, the force of my amendment says that there are a number of, I call them protected areas, that's my language, it's not UK government language, it might be language that the minister has a number of objections to, we, we shall see. Um, but it, for want of a better form of words, a number of protected areas, that is to say areas where it would be uh, irresponsible to exercise repatriated powers in a manner that would risk undermining, threatening, or jeopardizing the integrity of the UK's domestic market. And that where we are talking about the exercise of power in one of those protected fields, there is a requirement to act consistently with a uh, common framework. Well, the um, minister in the debate that we had in the chamber yesterday afternoon made great play of the fact that uh, I said that common frameworks need to be agreed, not imposed. Those aren't my words, convener. Those are the words of the Secretary of State for Scotland. That is the view of the United Kingdom government. Um, those, that is evidence that the Secretary, Secretary, of State of Scotland, Secretary of State for Scotland gave to the Scottish Affairs Committee in the House of Commons last year and repeated to the Finance and Constitution Committee here um, uh, a few weeks after he said it in the House of Commons. So it is the position of the Secretary of State um, that common frameworks need to be agreed, not imposed. And again, that is reflected in the force of my amendments. Now, I recognize that my amendments are deficient, which is why I'm not going to press them to a vote today. I'm going to re revisit them uh, and hope to bring them back at stage three. And the reason why they are deficient is because they were drafted um, before the um, Cabinet Office published uh, the list um, of um, uh, powers that sit in, again, I'm using jargon that has been used in the intergovernmental negotiations, sit in the various buckets. Um, uh, there are, uh, there's one bucket of powers where there is no problem in immediate devolution. There is another bucket of powers where there is a requirement uh, in the cabinet officer's view for uh, some sort of non-legislative framework. And then there is a third bucket where there is a requirement in the cabinet officer's view for um, uh, a legislative framework. And, I, and we don't yet know how much disagreement there is between the UK government on the one hand and the devolved administrations on the other about which powers sit in which buckets because we've only had publication and transparency from one side of that argument so far. So perhaps the minister might want to reflect on that uh, in a few moments. But clearly the list of protected fields uh, that we put into this legislation, if this is indeed the direction of travel that we embark upon, will need to reflect that agreement, if there is agreement, between the UK government on the one hand and the devolved administrations on the other about which powers sit in which buckets. In other words, which are the protected fields, which are the areas where it is important um, uh, in the interests of the continuing integrity of the United Kingdom's domestic market that repatriated powers are not used in a manner that seeks inadvertently or indeed deliberately uh, to undermine, jeopardize, or threaten the integrity of the UK's domestic uh, market. So um, the uh, uh, best place, in my view, and I think here the minister and I may be in agreement, I don't know, but the best place in my view for this, for this sort of provision to appear would be in the withdrawal bill. I'm not sure that they sit, these provisions sit perfectly in either section 11 or in section 13 of this bill. Um, but as I said, these are designed, uh, convened to be probing am amendments to test the extent to which um, the Scottish Government thinks at the moment, and I recognise that this is fluid, but to test the extent to which the Scottish Government and indeed other members of the Finance and Constitution Committee who may have a view about this, given that we wrote about it extensively in our interim report only a few weeks ago, um, I have to say about the, w whether this is the sort of solution that might work either in this legislation or in the withdrawal bill to square that circle between recognizing the demands of the devolution settlement on the one hand, but also recognizing that repatriated, re repatriated powers may not be used in a manner that inadvertently or deliberately seeks to undermine or threaten the integrity of the United Kingdom domestic market. Thank you. Uh, can I ask Adam Thomas, I know you might not be pressing them, but can I ask you to move at this stage? First thing I said. Okay, apologies. In which case, Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 148 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. My comments will follow on 
uh, very nicely from the salient points made by Adam Tompkins uh, on, on his views on this section and his own amendments. Uh, the principal uh, rationale and tone behind the narrative of our amendments in this grouping is that nothing in this bill should undermine the structures of the United Kingdom or the United Kingdom's internal market, and that is what our amendments seek to achieve. My amendments 148 and 154, which are similarly worded, uh, therefore I will cover them together. Now, this all refers to Section 13 of the bill. Section 13 is an interesting one, uh, because subsection 1 effectively, uh, in my interpretation of it, gives Scottish ministers uh, the power to subjectively cherry-pick after the UK leaves the Euro European Union, which EU decisions, regulations, uh, legislation or directives it would like to make by regulation provisions for. Now, the Minister is welcome to comment in his uh, own uh, summary if he thinks otherwise. Subsection 2 then goes on to say that it may omit any EU directive or regulation which has no practical application in Scotland, but unfortunately fails to define who decides whether or not EU subordinate legislation has any practical implication in Scotland. It is also worth bearing in mind that the wording of Section 13, as it currently stands, is that all this will take place after the, EU, uh, the UK leaves the EU. Now, when I questioned Tobias Locke in the Equalities and Human Rights Committee last week on this very issue uh, and asked him about uh, this practice, my understanding is that he thought that no non-EU country proactively incorporates EU legislation, regulation or directives into their domestic law in this fashion. Now, there may be sensible reasons why the Scottish Government may want to do this, but it's certainly an unprecedented practice, in my view. Now, as we know, the UK Government is engaged in many and quite complex negotiations with the European Union, which will have an impact on all nations of the UK for many years to come. It is imperative that we as a Parliament do not allow clauses to be passed in this bill that could be used to undermine the UK government in their negotiations with the EU. Now, this bill, uh, if passed, will, be, uh, will apply not just after exit day, but will also be live during any potential transitional period. Now, I accept that the Scottish Government may wish to hold back in regulating in specific devolved retained areas until after the deal with the European Union is finalised. Uh, and it, it should be allowed to do so where necessary. Uh, but if there is a requirement for a trade deal, if there is a requirement for common frameworks, then it is entirely possible that this clause, as currently worded, will allow the Scottish Government to make regulations which would inhibit the UK governments to do those trade deals and to uh, create those common frameworks. Uh, perhaps the Minister could clarify uh, also in his comments what his intention of Section 13 is in relation to the adoption of EU subordinate legislation after the UK has left the European Union. What is the intention behind it and what does he seek to achieve or benefit from it? Uh, those are my only comments uh, on my amendments and I move 148 and 154. Thank you. Any other member of the committee wanting to contribute this stage? James Kelly. Thank you, Convener. I note that Adam Tom Tompkins has, has indicated that He's not going to move these amendments and that they're probing amendments in the sense he's using the exercise to test the arguments and uh, test the views of other members of the committee. I mean, what I would say is that, uh, particularly in relation to Amendment 120, uh, which gives uh, consent to UK ministers uh, to withhold, uh, to basically withhold consent, um, I think that undermines the devolution settlement. Um, I, I agree with the principle of UK-wide frameworks, however, they have to be uh, set up uh, on, a, on a consensual basis, and I don't think this legislation uh, should be enshrining in it a principle that, that gives consent to UK ministers, and I would hope Mr. Cor Mr. Tompkins would bear that in mind in bringing back any amendments to stage three in this group. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, like uh, James Kelly, I recognise that Adam Tompkins doesn't intend to, to press these amendments to the vote, but I, I think it's just worth uh, reflecting that it seems to me in his remarks, what's implicit throughout 
uh, is the assumption that the, the way to achieve common frameworks uh, is around where power is placed, where authority and, uh, and the ability uh, to make law or regulations is placed between the two governments. Uh, that the way to achieve common frameworks, in effect, is to bind the hands of this parliament and this government. Uh, that's not the way to achieve common frameworks. That is the way to achieve imposed frameworks. Um, it, what we need is not simply the, 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 uh, the, the, the warm words in a statement from the current incumbent Secretary of State for Scotland. What we need is for the law to be clear uh, that common frameworks are, 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 are going to be the, the emergent result of action in multiple jurisdictions. One of the first pieces of legislation that I, I was involved in as a, as a committee member when I was elected here was on charity law. And both parliaments were legislating on charity law at about the same time because it was recognised that this is something which requires to operate uh, across these islands, across the UK, or at least across GB where many charities uh, operate in multiple legal jurisdictions uh, and have the, the, the same uh, identity, uh, the same employment structures, and we didn't want to create barriers that would make that impossible. That didn't require one parliament to legislate for everybody. It required cooperation and coordination. And the result was not language that we used the, the, the term common frameworks at the time, but effectively, that's what it was. Uh, and that, I think, is the way that we should be looking to achieve common frameworks where they're necessary. Uh, I just want to make a, a brief remark as well about Jamie Green's amendments uh, 148 and 154, and really to commend Jamie Green on his creativity uh, on, uh, on these amendments. The, the suggestion that we should pass amendments which effectively say the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government can have any policy we like as long as it's Tory policy, any Brexit we like as long as, as, long as it's the hardest of Tory Brexits, would be extraordinary. Uh, convener, the UK government had to produce an entire bill to achieve something that we all agreed was fundamentally incompatible with de devolution. Jamie Green has managed it in just three lines. It's clearly unsupportable, uh, but as a, as a work of perverse art, it's impeccable. Well done. <laughs> I'm not seeing any other member wishing to speak from the committee at this stage, so minister. I find it difficult to follow that in, in terms of the summary of Amendments 148 and, and 154. Let me deal with those uh, first of all. I, I entirely agree with uh, James Kelly and his overall view about the, 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 the um, undermining of the devolved settlement that some of these amendments would Im imply. But I'll come to Professor Tomkins' um, subtle amendments uh, shortly because I, I do want to treat them very seriously. Uh, but I think Patrick Harvey's example of the charity law uh, uh, legislation is very good. Uh, and it's one I, I tell him, quite frankly, I shall use again, because I think it illustrates absolutely clearly uh, how there are different dispensations, and those different dispensations work. But let me just deal with J Jamie Green's amendment. This, is, uh, th this would require the Scottish Government, essentially, to uh, sit on its hands uh, until it was told things by the UK Government, and then it would act, and then it would discover that the UK Government had changed its mind. Because it's not even binding this process to something that we know or understand, it is binding it to UK government policy, which even a sympathetic observer would indicate it does change from time to time uh, without being told, uh, and anybody else being told. But it would also bind us to, and I quote, the negotiating lines of the UK government in their negotiations. Now, the UK government has repeatedly said that it does not intend to publicize its negotiating lines. So this would bind us to a secret protocol, which we do not know, which we could not find out, but we would have to observe at all times. This is, frankly, and with the greatest of respect, convener, nonsense. And both of these amendments are nonsensical and should not detain us. Let me, however, go to Professor Tomkins, very subtle um, uh, uh, amendments. And uh, they are, I think, a, a clever attempt to probe what the, the, the position of the, the Scottish and Welsh governments are in some matters. I, I would use the word sophistry as a compliment to Professor Tompkins in this, because I think they are well thought through. But I have to say that um, the Professor Tompkins uh, description of where the present situation lies in terms of buckets of powers uh, is defective in a key regard. It's defective because there is no lid on those buckets. 
There's nothing that says we've put those things in those buckets, we can now agree those buckets and move on. One of the, the key issue in here is the United Kingdom government could put other things in those buckets at any time without any consultation and we would simply have to accept it. They could fill the bucket to the brim of all the powers that the Scottish Parliament has and there is nothing we could do about it. So it is not the issue of what is in those buckets, that is a matter for discussion and negotiation, and indeed uh, Professor Tomkins' uh, Amendment 121 already include things which have been moved to other buckets without consultation, but it is actually uh, an issue of the powers of the Parliament and the devolved settlement, as Mr Kelly has indicated, and respecting that devolved settlement as it operates. So, uh, agreed, not imposed, was uh, what Mr. Tompkins, Professor Tomkins said yesterday. He now says those weren't his words, but the words of the Secretary of State. Uh, I accept that. They are both his words and the words of the Secretary of State. They are not yet the words of the UK government. And that is the problem. It is a problem, first of all, that the Secretary of State, who is a, a, a minister of the UK government, is using them, but the UK government isn't using them. And it's a problem because the amendment as presented to the House of Lords this week is not based on agreement, it is based on imposition. So until that changes, there cannot be an agreement. But I do think, to, to give uh, Professor Tomkins some credit, I do think there are elements in this which would help in the negotiating process. Uh, the elements would uh, certainly include the fact that ministers of the Crown would not act where the Scottish uh, Government and the Scottish Parliament had the clear competence and was acting in that competence, and that any actions would have to be by agreement. Um, I, I find these useful, those useful. Uh, I'm very happy if, if Professor Tompkins does not move them, then we can have a discussion later on. I do think it would be better to have them in a withdrawal bill than in, uh, than in um, uh, other legislation, but I'm happy to discuss that. But uh, convener to return to Jamie Green, as the negotiating lines of the UK government are in a sealed box, I'm not prepared to set policy on the basis of something somebody else has put in a sealed box or in a bucket. Thank you, Adam Tompkins, to wind up. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'd like to thank all the members who've contributed to the debate in this group, particularly the Minister, for his um, reflections on um, uh, my uh, amendments, although I'm not sure that I'm going to take sophistry as the compliment um, that he perhaps intended. Um, subtle, I'll take as a, as a compliment. Well thought through, I'll certainly take, um, uh, and I'll think about buckets and lids. Um, uh, I'd like to respond first to what James Kelly said. Um, uh, I, I, I'm sure this is my fault, but perhaps um, uh, uh, I was unclear in what I said in introducing the amendments. There, there, there is no sense, convener, in which um, uh, the amendments in my name in this group undermine the devolution settlement, which are the words that James Kelly uh, used. Um, the consent of a Minister of the Crown in uh, Amendment 120 is required in order to safeguard the integrity of the United Kingdom. And I would have thought that James Kelly, as a member of the Labour Party, would have understood, not just understood, but would have supported that rather than criticised it. Um, it, is the, it is the responsibility of Ministers of the Crown, it is the responsibility of the United Kingdom government of whatever political colour to safeguard and protect the integrity of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, the, uh, that does not mean that there is in any sense any kind of imposition here by UK ministers on devolved uh, administrations. In uh, Amendment 122, it says, and I, you know, if, if there's a way of making this clearer, then advise me, but it says, to my mind, perfectly clearly, a United Kingdom government, uh, sorry, United Kingdom common framework has been agreed between the devolved administrations and the United Kingdom government. So ministers of the Crown may not exercise their powers where there has been an agreed common framework. And again, I don't, I don't know what is so baffling or so confusing or so bewildering to Mr. Harvey or even more concerningly to Mr. Kelly uh, about, about the use of that word uh, agreement. I don't know how it could be made clearer, but if you can advise me, Mr. Kelly or Mr. Harvey, about how it could be made clearer, then I'm happy uh, to take that uh, uh, advice. I, I hear what the minister has to say about the, the movable feasts that we, see, that we see in the buckets. I think that's a well-made point uh, and, and I will reflect on that between now and, and stage three, perhaps in consultation with him and or, and or his officials. I, I do think um, that within the scheme that is sketched in these amendments, there is a possible uh, solution to the current impasse uh, between the devolved administrations on the one hand and the United Kingdom government on the other um, uh, about the, uh, the way in which Brexit is legislated for in a manner that is completely coherent, that respects the integrity of the United Kingdom and also respects in all its particulars, 
um, the uh, devolution uh, settlement. And I'm very happy to uh, continue uh, conversations publicly or privately uh, with UK ministers or uh, uh, Scottish ministers or anybody else to see if we can broker that, um, uh, that deal, um, which would be completely consistent, I think, convener, with everything that the Finance Committee said in its interim report uh, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, but I seek to withdraw Amendment 120. Thank you. Uh, on, on seeking to withdraw that, can I ask any other member present if they object to the amendments being withdrawn? No member which, uh, objects. I therefore call Amendment 121 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated 120. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 122 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 120. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Not moved. Amendment 123 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 120. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I now call Amendment 124 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 115. And I remember members that if Amendment 124 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 10 because there's a preemption. Neil Bibby, to move or not move? Move. There will be a division. No, no. No. Question. Sorry, I better put the question first. <laughs> the question is that Amendment 124 be agreed or well agreed? Yes. There will now be a division. <laughs> All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 124, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 10 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 115. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? I move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 11 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 115. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division in that case. The, sorry, the, que the, the question 11 is will it be agreed or not agreed? And, and so, so, all those in favour, please raise your hand. All, the, all those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 11, the, there were six votes for, five against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I now call Amendment 12 in the name of Tavis Scott, already debated with Amendment 115. Tavis Scott to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise a hand. On Amendment 12, there were six votes for, five against. The Amendment 12 is therefore agreed to. I now call Amendment 13 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 115. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed, or we all agreed? There will be division. All those in favour, please show their, raise their hands. All those against, please raise your hands. On Amendment 13, and there were six votes for, five against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I now call Amendment 14 in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with Amendment 115. James Kelly to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed or well agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 14, there were six votes for, five against. That means that the amendment is therefore agreed to. I now call the Amendment 15 in the name of Tavish Scott. I read debate with Amendment 115. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Move, Commissioner. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed or well agreed. There will be a division. <coughs> All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. 
One amendment 15, there were six votes for, five against. Therefore, the amendment is therefore agreed to. I now call amendment 16 in the name of Tavish Scott. Already debated with amendment 115. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move, Convener. Thank you. The question is that amendment 16 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I now call amendment 125 in the name of Dean Lockhart, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Members will note from the groupings that there are a number of preemptions in this group and will remain members of the preemption when I call the relevant amendment. Dean Lockhart to move amendment 125 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. <coughs> I have tabled four amendments in this grouping, amendments 125, 131, 139 and 1. Uh, six zero. I will deal with amendments 125, 139 and 160 together because these amendments operate in a similar fashion. Uh, these amendments relate to the wide-ranging powers conferred on Scottish ministers to make regulations without the approval of the Scottish Parliament under section 11.1, section 12.1 and section 13.1. As currently drafted, the bill provides that these regulatory powers conferred on ministers may be used to make any kind of provision that could be made by an act of the Scottish Parliament. The relevant provisions are to be found in sections 11.5, 12.2 and 13.3. Again, evidence received from experts on the draft legislation has highlighted a number of concerns surrounding these wide-ranging powers to be conferred on ministers. In evidence given to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee last week, Professor Nicola McEwen highlighted concerns about these powers as follows. I would be concerned at the extent to which this section affords ministerial powers rather than legislative powers or appropriate scrutiny by Parliament. It is appropriate for those to be explored with proper scrutiny and consultation. In addition, the Law Society of Scotland has called for clarity in relation to the scope and application of the wide-ranging powers conferred on Scottish ministers to make regulations under section 11.1. 12.1 and uh, section 13.1. Other evidence received from uh, constitutional experts, Professor Alan Page has highlighted concerns that Scottish ministers will be taking powers to implement EU instruments over which the Scottish Parliament will have had no say, a potentially major surrender, in his words, by the Parliament of its legislative competence and one which under the bill as introduced may be extended indefinitely. Convener, there is concern that while many of the detailed provisions of sections 11, 12 and 13 seek to limit the scope and operation of these ministerial powers, for example, sections 11, 8, 12, 3 and section 13, 5 set out examples of what these regulations cannot cover, a proverbial coach and horse is then driven through these limitations by the overriding provisions of sections 11.5, 12.2 and 13.3, which contradict these limitations by declaring that the ministerial powers may be used to make any kind of provision that could be made by an act of the Scottish Parliament. These are indeed special powers as described by the minister earlier. To uh, address concerns expressed by the Law Society of Scotland and other experts and to resolve legal uncertainty surrounding potentially conflicting provisions of these sections, my amendments 125, 139 and 160 seek to provide clarity on the operation of sections 11, 1, 12, 1 and 13, 1 <coughs> by deleting the overriding provision that these ministerial regulations may be used to make any kind of provision that could be made by an act of the Scottish Parliament. Deleting this overriding provision not only provides legal, un legal certainty, but it clearly upholds the proper role of this Parliament. And let me make it clear um, that this amendment uh, does not st stop the, the Scottish Government from setting out in more detail in the legislation, more specific detail, what these ministerial powers can and cannot cover as some of the provisions in sections 11, 12 and 13 already attempt to do. 
Convener, moving on to Amendment 131 in my name, this provides for additional protections where ministers exercise their powers under Section 11.1 and 11.9. Section 11.9 Section 11 is currently drafted provides that ministers may issue regulations that remove or modify a legal protection in certain circumstances, including under paragraph 11.8d, removing any protection relating to the independence of judicial decision-making or decision-making of a judicial nature by a person occupying a judicial office or otherwise make provision inconsistent with the duty in section one of the Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act 2008, guarantee of the continued independence of the judiciary and in section 11.8 subparagraph I, modify the Equality Act 2006 or the Equality Act 2010. The um, ministers may only remove these protections or make the modification specified if under section 11.9, alternative provision is made in ministerial regulations that is broadly equivalent to the protection being removed or other provision being modified. The impact of my amendment 131 is to add additional safeguards in these events, in the event that ministerial uh, power is exercised to remove or modify protections. And my amendment um, provides that any protection can only be removed or modification made by ministers if provision is also uh, given uh, to a, an additional level of protection in law, no less than the protection being removed and the provision being modified. Convener, I would hope that this amendment is not considered uh, controversial, as the additional wording is aimed at ensuring ministerial regulations do not have the unintended consequence of removing protections already in place under law. And I will talk to the other amendments in my winding up. Thank you. Tavish Scott to speak to amendment 17 and other amendments in the group. Uh, I'm grateful, Convener. Um, I, this follows the remarks I made in the Stage 2 uh, debate yesterday in relation to the scope of the powers uh, in the Bill. Uh, I don't want to see new quangos created by regulation, nor do I want to see new criminal offences created by regulation. If ministers have need for those elements, then they should bring forward normal primary legislation to allow Parliament to offer scrutiny, amendment and detailed consideration. Amendment 17, therefore, and Amendment 24 prevent the creation of, of a new public body through these regulations. Amendment 26, in fact, adds the creation of new quangos onto the list of things that cannot be done by this section. Amendment 26 transfers the creation of new quangos from the permitted list to the forbidden list under these uh, regulations. Uh, if ministers have need to establish a new quango to keep pace with European Union law for the next 15 ye years, then they will need to bring forward primary legislation so that Parliament can decide if the new body is required whether it's, and whether its functions can be dealt with by existing bodies. Now, normal parliamentary procedures would allow that kind of detailed consideration. I'm concerned that were we not to have that, uh, that kind of detailed consideration may not happen. Amendments 18 and 23 prevent the creation of new criminal offences through these regulations. At the moment, as I understand it and as I can read it, the Bill prevents the creation of a relevant criminal offence. This is defined later as an offence for which uh, those guilty can be sentenced for up to two years in prison. Now, that does seem a very significant power to put forward through regulation with no chance of amendment by this Parliament. Deleting the word relevant will mean that all new criminal offences have to be established by primary legislation, and that is surely the purpose of this place. Amendment 19 adds an additional test to the permissibility of regulation. It proposes that regulations must not increase legislative burdens on businesses or indeed individuals. If ministers have need or wish to increase the burdens, they should do that through primary legislation publish a bill, hear evidence from those affected and allow members of this parliament to provide amendments to mitigate the burdens as they see fit. That can't be done through regulations, so this additional test should be added to the bill. And on that basis, uh, uh, convener, I wish to move 17. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 126 and other amendments in the group. 
Uh, thank you, um, convener. I'll speak to amendments one to six uh, first of all, and then one four two separately. Um, the existing wording of section eleven, subsection six, uh, allows for the establishment of a Scottish uh, public authority uh, to uh, carry out uh, functions uh, under any new regulation that's introduced. My amendment uh, is actually designed to be helpful to Scottish ministers in that respect. Um, in addition to the creation of a Scottish public authority, which I believe is the premise of subsection 6b, uh, uh, my additional wording will also allow the minister the ability to amend the object and purpose of a public authority to enable it to carry out its functions uh, uh, as any additional functions are put upon it under subsection 1. Uh, so whilst I hope the Minister welcomes this ability, uh, it is worth pointing out that there are some drawbacks uh, and the potential consequences of expanding or introducing new agencies uh, uh, in Scotland to deal with any new regulations uh, as are brought in. I think that's a point uh, quite eloquently made by Tavish Scott around the uh, setup of new quangos, etc. Um, my concern is that not only may we be overloading our public authorities uh, by having them to carry out functions which are currently exercised in Brussels, it is unlikely that without quite significant adaptations in workforce, infrastructure, and uh, with financial uh, backing, current agencies in their existing forms uh, may struggle uh, to deal uh, with those, uh, especially those uh, EU laws which are transport, transposed into uh, our system. Uh, in evidence section, Do Dr. Kirsty Hughes, the director of the Scottish Centre on European Relations, uh, made this very pertinent point in evidence uh, last week. Now, to give you an example, uh, I think anyone who's ever been to Brussels will comprehend my anxiety around the sort of support infrastructure that's required uh, to deal with uh, uh, the uh, uh, just the uh, level and quantities of EU law that we may have to bring over. If you look at an example of the uh, DG uh, Agriculture and Rural Development, which is pertinent to my Rural Economy Committee, that's comprised of 10 sub-directorates. Each one of those sub-directorates have 48 units below them. Each one of those units have a head of unit. Each one of those units has two deputies. There are three deputy director generals, two assistants to the director general and the director general, and that's just the management level. Now, I'm not saying that all of this will be necessary in Scotland, given that these DGs uh, manage 28 member states, but certainly much of this and much of the functions of these agencies will need to be carried out in the Scottish Civil Service. So my amendment allows for not just the additional creation uh, of new public authorities, uh, but allows us instead perhaps to amend existing public authorities to enable to carry out functions regarding devolved retained uh, EU law. Um, it is, uh, we will discuss later in other amendments uh, the uh, consequences of this financially, uh, so I'll leave that till later. Uh, briefly on uh, Amendment 142, um, my understanding of this, uh, and it jumped out at me when I read this bill, is that it's saying that regulations under this section, the section being Section 12, complying with international obligations, uh, point F says that uh, un uh, this, under uh, the section, uh, they may not be made to implement the UK withdrawal agreement. And those words uh, jumped out at me. It's entirely unclear what the consequence of that m may be. I would implore the minister uh, that uh, he could explain to us what the intention of this is. Uh, if uh, there is no uh, need to implement the UK withdrawal agreement, what is the rationale behind that, and what is the potential consequence of that. It seems to uh, fly in the face of the uh, previous uh, uh, points on this, where the Scottish ministers may, be, may by regulation bring in provisions to deal with uh, breaches of international obligations as they see fit uh, of the UK's uh, withdrawal of the EU, and I made previous comments on my reservations around that anyway, but that specific line, I think, was entirely unclear uh, why it was in there, and I propose to remove it 
uh, uh, I'll, I'll await the um, feedback from the Minister before deciding whether to move that amendment to remove that uh, line 14. Thank you. Liam Kerr to speak to Amendment 130 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Do you wish me to speak to Amendment 129 in the name yes. of Graeme Simpson? Given that you're speaking to other amendments in the group and that um, Graeme Simpson is not here, please feel free to do so. Thank you, Convener. Uh, therefore, I will speak to Amendment 129 in the name of Graeme Simpson first and will move it on his behalf. And, but I am grateful to the Convener for allowing me that uh, opportunity. This crucial amendment, 129, would reduce the Minister's rights to change legislation relating to the independence of the judiciary and in relation to the Equality Act. Section 11.1 allows that where Ministers consider that there is a deficiency, they may make regulations as they consider appropriate. Section 11.8 provides limits on these powers. Now section 11.9, as drafted, states that the section 11.8 limits on making regulations affecting the independence of the judiciary or the Equality Acts can be waived, providing that broadly equivalent provisions are put in their place. And I shall revisit that issue, the, the broadly equivalent, in my Amendment 130 shortly. Section 1 of the Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act 2008, referenced in 11.8d, guarantees the independence of the Supreme Court and Scottish and international courts from interference by MSPs or the Lord Advocate. The Equality Act of 2010 and its precursor 2006 Act, referenced in 11.8i, bring together earlier provisions to counter discrimination. Dealing with that second Act first, subsection 11.9, in relating to 11.8i, states an alternative provision can be made for modifications under the Equalities Act. Yet, I'm concerned that it is not within the Scottish Parliament's power to modify what is UK legislation. Thus, the provision of 11.9, by implication, risks representing a serious overstatement of the Scottish Parliament's power, and for that reason, it must be removed. Furthermore, it is highly inappropriate that any mechanism should exist for ministers to legislate without the consent of the Scottish Parliament in any area that would affect Section 1 of the Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act 2008. That seems to be the practical impact of this <coughs> section. And furthermore, I cannot understand why the areas set out in Section 11.8 should all be completely protected, save in regard to these two. That makes me suspicious. We've heard members' concerns about a power grab by the executive by seeking to do things where ministers feel it appropriate and seeking to create and harness new derogations and abilities to themselves. This Amendment 129 is crucial in ensuring that ministers cannot change legislation relating to the independence of the judiciary and the Equality Act. Now, moving on to my own Amendment 130 in Section 11, uh, where I've suggested leaving out the word broadly. This raises similar concerns to those made by Dean Lockhart in relation to his Amendment 131. This subsection is very important. It effectively gives ministers the right to make changes to things that relate to the independence of the judiciary and to modify the Equality Act. That right has to be specific. These areas of law are far too important to be tampering with. As drafted, this subsection means that ministers can make changes relating to the independence of the judiciary or the Equality Act if the regulations that they are bringing in are broadly equivalent to that being removed or changed. But what does that mean? We just don't know. But clearly, broadly equivalent is vague enough that the new protection for the independence of the judiciary or, for example, the new definition of equality could be lower than the existing protection, and that is not acceptable on any analysis and must not be countenanced. So it should either be equivalent or it should not be allowed. By removing the word broadly, we make it clear that if ministers want to change these very important areas, it has to be at the level of the existing protection or provision, not less. Now, anticipating the minister again, which I am keen to do, I believe the term broadly equivalent is most often used in the context of compatible trade and standards regimes. For example, packaging. The application is surely different in a legislative context, particularly one of this 
magnitude. The wording of this section clearly has not been sufficiently tightly worded, and for safety, the word broadly should be removed and Amendment 130 be agreed to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Murdo Fraser to speak to Amendment 144 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I'd like to speak to um, Amendment 144 and I'll comment briefly on some of the other amendments in the group. Uh, amendment 144 seeks to delete subsection 4 uh, in uh, section 12 of the bill. In effect, this is a probing amendment because I'm not entirely clear what is in the mind of ministers in relation to this particular subsection. I'd like to uh, understand more fully from the minister uh, what his intention is, and I will decide once I've heard from him whether or not I would intend to press this to uh, a vote. The background to this is that section 12 sets out the right to make regulations to meet international obligations. Subsection 3 sets out exceptions to that, saying that regulations may not impose taxes, make retrospective provision, or create criminal offences, and so on. Subsection 3D says the right to make regulations cannot remove any protection of independence of the judiciary. And subsection 3I says the right to make regulations cannot modify the Equality Act 2006 or the Equality Act 2010. What subsection 4 then does is add a qualification to those exceptions. And the purpose of this amendment is to check whether that qualification is actually necessary. Subsection 4 says that the regulations can be made that would remove protection from the judiciary and can be made that would modify the Equality Act if, and I quote, alternative provision is made in the regulations that is broadly equivalent to the protection being removed or the provision being modified. And that raises a number of questions, and uh, I feel I might be echoing Liam Kerr here, but um, I'm wondering what the term broadly equivalent is meant to mean, and what is alternative provision? And why would the government seek to have these powers? What is the government intending to do with these particular measures? The issues at stake in relation to this subsection, independence of the judiciary, equality uh, acts that govern so many rules, are very important and substantial matters of public law. And this is an area that requires further discussion. So the amendment as drafted would remove subsection four altogether. The effect would be that in relation to section 12, ministers would still have the right to regulation. Uh, and as per subsection three, there are qualifications to that, but there's no further qualification to the qualification with vague definitions of further changes. An alternative approach would be to clarify by setting out what equivalence means or what alternative provision means, but that clearly requires an answer to the basic question, why does the government feel it needs the ability to make changes to the law in these very important and sensitive areas? So I look forward to hearing from the Minister uh, when he's responding as to what the rationale is behind uh, subsection 4, and at that point I'll decide whether or not to uh, put this to a vote. Just to comment briefly on the other amendments in this group, uh, I would support all the amendments uh, that are being proposed. Um, I think the amendments in the name of Tavish Scott are particularly important, and I thought in, in uh, moving uh, his amendments, Tavish Scott made some very important points about the very significant matters on which ministers are seeking to take power uh, to make uh, law by regulation rather than doing that by primary legislation. We've heard a lot of rhetoric around this bill in terms of a power grab. I think the most egregious example of a power grab we've found so far is actually what is contained in Section 11, uh, where ministers are seeking to take power from Parliament in a whole range of areas. And that is why I would be keen to support Tavish Scott's amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gordon Lindor to speak to Amendment 145 and other amendments in the group. <clears throat> Thank you, convener. My amendment 145 makes a simple uh, but significant amendment to section 12, and I now move it. Section 12 is, of course, a section empowering Scottish ministers to make such provision as they consider appropriate by regulations where they consider that there, there is or would be a breach of international obligations arising from withdrawal, and that it is necessary to make provision to prevent or remedy the breach. So the section is premised on something which is almost entirely subjective. 
in the consideration of the Scottish ministers and in their minds. And I, I make reference in passing without going into what is said in the Law Society of Scotland's comments, both on section 12 and about legal certainty. <clears throat> Bearing all of this in mind, I turn now to my amendment and it is to subsection four, which itself restricts protections intended to be provided in subsection three against the exercise of the powers given to the Scottish ministers in section 12. The restriction of subsection four is of course limited to the provisions of subsection 3D and 3I, but it allows removal of a protection if alternative provision is made in the regulations that is broadly equivalent to the protection being removed, and so on. This is not good enough. The word broadly should be left out for very good reason. It adds to the uncertainty of the provision. Why not have, as my amendment proposes, equivalent provision for the protection of rights? Now, the committee has heard with interest my colleague Liam Kerr's Oxford definitions, and I hope the committee will not be disappointed with my more broad brush approach to the word broadly. A simple definition of it is, in general and without considering minor details or widely and openly. In other words, use of the word broadly provides in the context we are speaking about no definition at all. And when this relates to removal of protection and interference with rights, it is imperative that the section be clarified to provide actual equivalence. That is a word which is clear. And my amendment is in accordance with, in particular, amendments 130 and 131, which I commend to the committee. Now, the minister yesterday said that the Act has to work within its own terms. And who could disagree with such a proposition? It might indeed be called a legal tautologism. And indeed, he also commented on littering the statute book with unnecessary provisions. But now is not the time or place to comment on the Scottish Government's legislative programme. However, if the minister were serious about statutory litter, he would simply withdraw this bill. That would be the ultimate tidying up exercise here. A lighter alternative, delete subsection four as Murdo Fraser has posited. Uh, but failing that, minister, the least that the minister could do is to agree to leave the humble word broadly out of it. Thank you. Does any other member wish to... Neil Bibby. Thank you, convener. Um, as with other groupings, we understand the Scottish Government must have new powers to manage a period of transition and to ob absorb EU law into Scots law. However, as we said previously, those powers must be proportionate and must be balanced. Uh, whilst I may not support a number of amendments uh, from Conservative members in this group, there are some which could potentially help achieve that balance, and I will support Amendment 130, for example, in the name of Liam Kerr, who moves the word broadly from a reference in Section 11, page 9, to equivalence of regulations. This is an instance where the bill benefits from more precise language. Uh, I will also support Tavis Scott's amendments in this group. I share his reservations about the creation of a new public body or a new criminal offence through regulation-making powers arising from this bill. Amendment 26 would specifically forbid the creation of a new quango under these regulation-making powers. In our judgment, the Tavis Scott's amendments are fair, proportionate amendments, and we'll support them this month. Sorry, Patrick Harvey. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I'll just make a, a few comments about the amendments that I'm drawn toward uh, and uh, ignore the others for the moment and uh, hopefully the Minister will have a, a chance to respond. Um, first of all, uh, in relation to um, Amendment 145 and uh, 130, both of which seek to remove the word broadly, uh, and 131, which uh, uh, adds uh, 
a, a, an additional caveat to the um, uh, first uh, removal of the word broadly. Uh, I, um, I do so see some, uh, some merit in that. I, uh, I know that uh, Gordon Lindhurst uh, tells us that he sees that as, as legislative decluttering. I can, uh, I can tell him that I have a number of anarchist friends who think the world is far too cluttered with legislation in general, and uh, perhaps, uh, unlike last night, he might uh, want to explore that uh, a little further. Uh, I promise they, they, don't, uh, they don't have any whiff about them at all. Um, but I, I do think it would be good to hear the minister uh, explain why he feels removing these, if he does, would be inappropriate. It does seem to me that they give some clarity, uh, and in particular the, uh, the addition in Amendment 131, uh, which uh, ensures no less than the protection being removed. Uh, I, I see some, uh, some merit in that. In, in relation to, um, the, I think there are two amendments which uh, address the word relevant in relation to criminal offences. I think that's 23 and 25. Um, it may be my fault, but I can't see uh, where that term relevant is defined in, in the context of, uh, uh, of those parts. So it would be helpful if the minister could tell me uh, what is meant there by relevant criminal offences uh, and why it's necessary to, um, uh, to restrict it in those, uh, in those areas. And in relation to public bodies, um, I see some, uh, some strong argument for um, restricting the power to create new public bodies, particularly in light of uh, Jamie Green's amendment. You see, Jamie Green is quite capable of uh, turning his, uh, his legislative creative powers to uh, constructive use rather than destructive. Uh, and I think the, uh, the additional power to amend by regulation uh, the, the, the object and purpose of a public authority may allow ministers to take a new function which needs to be newly exercised in the devolved landscape and give it to an existing body without uh, undermining uh, its, uh, its current functions. I think that would be uh, potentially would remove the need to create new bodies. So if the minister can give some clear examples of why there might be a need uh, for the Scottish Government to propose the creation of a new body uh, in this way, uh, without primary legislation but by regulations, I would like to hear that. Uh, it, it does seem to me uh, that there's some case, that there's some, some good argument for requiring them to bring primary legislation uh, if, that, if they want to make the case for a new body. Uh, but if, they, uh, if the minister wants to tell us why that would be necessary and in what circumstances he thinks it would be necessary to do it by regulations, uh, then I'd be interested in hearing it. Um, I think those are the, the only amendments I wanted to, to mention. Thank you. Somebody else has indicated they wish to speak at this stage. Minister. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, convener. And once again, we are in a key section. Uh, these sections of the bill we're dealing with at the moment, and we'll go on uh, to deal with the, the next two sections, deal with the uh, scrutiny and with the restraint on ministerial power. And therefore, I will be indicating the acceptance of certain amendments uh, during, during my comments. Uh, not, again, not all of them, because not all of them can be accepted for a variety of reasons which I will give. Uh, but can I just preface this by saying that uh, no one would be in any doubt that the Scottish Government is opposed to Brexit. Nobody would be in any doubt that I am opposed to Brexit. And in normal circumstances, the Scottish Government would not have sought powers of this breadth. But we're not in those circumstances. It, cir these are necessary in many cases because of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Indeed, they are the only way in which we can properly prepare our devolved laws in the time we have for the shock and disruption of a Brexit that is being forced upon us. We've always recognized that. We've no desire to take powers any broader than is needed. And that is why we are also very flexible in this process, listening to people's concerns, trying to go further. And I'll indicate that in a moment. But let me set out very briefly the changes we've already made in the continuity bill compared with the UK withdrawal bill. We've introduced a, a test of necessity. We've set out additional limitations on the powers. We've provided an enhanced procedure for scrutiny of the most significant uses of those powers. And I'm also mindful of the votes that the committee has just had on, on clauses 11 to 15, indicating that the, the committee wants to go further. And I understand that, and I'll do everything in my power uh, to help the committee to do that, but again, where it can be done. 
and we consider the steps we've already taken and are taking uh, to address legitimate concerns that are held by members and across the, the whole the chamber. But I remind members that these broad powers are needed because of the scale of the task that is facing us. EU law and the EU institutions are woven throughout our law. They've been there for almost half a century, and they're not easy to disentangle. Broad powers are also needed because of the sheer uncertainty involved in the UK's negotiations with the EU. 20 months on from the referendum in June 16, we are a little closer to knowing the details of the scenario in which the UK will leave the EU. And therefore, in many cases, what sorts of changes will be, need to be made our laws and by when are still very cloudy indeed. That uncertainty isn't of our making, but again, I want to do all I can to balance that with the, the absolutely legitimate desire to make sure there is the strongest possible, appropriate and necessary scrutiny and ministerial restraint. Let me speak to each amendment in the group, therefore. Dean Lockhart's amendments 125, 139, 160 appear to be aimed at limiting the scope of what can be done using uh, sections 11, 12 and 13. And I cannot therefore support these amendments largely because of their wording. There is no clear category of things that require to be done in an act of the Scottish Parliament, and those are the words of his amendment. Sections 11, 12 and 13 are drawn to set out exactly what the power is and the limits that apply. These amendments might raise uh, uh, interesting questions for the courts, but we don't feel that such questions uh, are necessary and would limit what is actually possible to do. Tavish Scott's Amendment 17 would prevent the fixing powers from being used to establish new public authorities, and Tavish Scott's Amendments 24 and 26 would prevent the keeping pace power from being used to establish a new public authority. The Scottish Government is content to accept that while keeping pace with EU law requires the establishment of a public authority, th that should only be capable of being done by way of primary legislation, and therefore I would suggest that the Committee should pass 24 and 26. Amendment 126 from Jamie Green goes in a rather odd direction. It appears to expand the powers of Scottish ministers, allowing the powers to be used to adjust the general purposes of a public authority. We actually don't think that would be an appropriate use of the fixing power, and that's why we would reject this amendment. Uh, amendments 18, 23 and 25 from Tavish Scott would see the powers restricted so that no criminal offence at all could be created using them. That they are already restricted, however, to the creation of relevant offences which is offences punishable by two years or less by way of imprisonment. That is defined in section 27 of the bill. And that is the same test as for the current powers to implement EU law. There is no change in that test. In many situations, establishing a suitable set of enforcement mechanisms in an area of EU law will require the creation of regulatory offences. The Scottish Government therefore would like the committee to reject these amendments. If we did not, then in many cases setting up enforcement mechanisms could only be done on a lengthy process of primary legislation. It would interfere with the purpose of the bill, and it is constrained by the existing powers uh, in EU law. Amendment 19 would supplement the list of things that the powers cannot be used to do. Now, it's similar to some amendments we've debated already. It would prevent the powers from being able, for example, to increase burdens on individuals and businesses. That's an entirely laudable aim, but the amendment misunderstands and undermines the nature of the powers conferred on Scottish ministers under sections 11 and 12 of the bill. Those powers are limited in the bill itself to being used where necessary, in being used where necessary to a particular aim. In section 11, for example, they can only be used where it's necessary to prevent, remedy, or mitigate a failure or deficiency. Subsection 2 of section 11 sets out an exhaust inclusive, exhaustive list of the types of deficiencies covered. These are the only circumstances where this power could be used. If there is no deficiency caused by EU exit, it is not necessary to remedy it, and then there is therefore no power available. These powers are therefore not an opportunity to go through the body of EU law and make policy changes. They are solely about discharging our responsibility to make the changes required to keep that body of law operating sensibly. And it's important to have that really in the forefront of our minds. These powers are not, as I say, an opportunity to go through the body of law and make changes. That might be desirable, but that's not what we're trying to do, nor could we do it. They're about discharging our responsibility to make the changes required to keep that body of law operating sensibly as it is, or modified if there are failures of deficiencies, but only 
if there are failures and deficiencies, and to the extent that those failures and deficiencies are rectified. Um, the Scottish ministers could never use these powers to make substantial policy changes, but the test amendment 19 would put in the bill would make the powers opaque and difficult to operate. Leaving the EU is going to be very complex. It is complex already. It may well be necessary to make some changes that taken on their own could involve increasing a burden on an individual or business. That is regrettably the nature of the task, and the restrictions these amendments would place on the powers would be complex, imprecise, and very difficult to apply. And therefore, while I understand the motivation, I would urge members to reject Amendment 19. Amendments 129 and 144 from Graham Simpson and Murdo Fraser would remove the rule that allows a modification for protection to take place in certain circumstances, as long as alternative provision broadly equivalent to that protection is made at the same time. These provisions were drawn from protections in the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010, and they are a sensible, flexible rule. We wouldn't want to prejudge the exact form of any amendment might have to take or exactly how it could be drafted. However, we do recognize and support the point made by Liam Kerr and Gordon Lyndhurst in their amendments 130 and 145, which would remove the word broadly from this rule, requiring any replacement protection to be exactly equivalent. I therefore recommend that members vote against amendments 129 and 144, but for amendments 130 and 145. If members vote for the two amendments to remove the word broadly, then voting for Dean Lockhart's amendment 131 becomes unnecessary. It would require any replacement to protection to be no less than the protection modified. And this is better achieved by the amendments 130 and 145. Finally, Jamie Green's Amendment 142 would remove a limit currently under Section 12 power. A presently, withdrawal agreement is exempted, accepted from the power. As I've explained to members, we did not take a corresponding power to Clause 9 of the EU Withdrawal Bill, specifically empowering us to implement the terms of the withdrawal agreement by subordinate legislation, and I explained that yesterday. Now, I understand the point of Jamie Green's amendment. On reflection, I can see, and no doubt he will be surprised by these words too, that it could be a valuable adjustment to the way the bill works. If the interaction between an existing international agreement and the withdrawal agreement was complex, we wouldn't want to be prohibited from taking it into account in our use of the Section 12 power. And I am therefore content to support Mr. Green's Amendment 142. Dean Lockhart, to, to wind up. Dean. Uh, th thank you, convener. Um, the Minister um, again started his response on a positive note, indicating that he would accept many of the amendments, but uh, he then went on to decline most of them. Uh, let me first address my amendment 125 before turning to the amendments proposed by other members. It is uh, disappointing that the uh, amendments in uh, 125, 131 and 160 were not accepted uh, by the Minister. My amendments were based on comments and concerns raised by the Law Society of Scotland and other experts concerned about the open-ended powers, uh, the so-called special powers being conferred on Ministers to make provision of any kind that could be made by an Act of Parliament. Now, the Minister, in his statement, said that there is uncertainty over what would be covered by the statement, any, any um, provision that could be made by an Act of Parliament. Well, that uncertainty is another good reason why that overriding provision should not be included in the draft legislation. Um, if the Minister wants clarity and wants to set out exactly the scope and the operation of the ministerial powers, then the better approach, as we have indicated, is to detail what those ministerial powers can and cannot cover in the uh, uh, legislation itself, rather than have an, an overriding catch-all provision that uh, is set out in sections 11.5, 12.2 and 13.3, which uh, provide that all-encompassing power that ministers can make any provision that would be made by an Act of Parliament. Uh, we feel that this uh, does indeed, in the view uh, expressed by experts, uh, support the view that the bill shows scant respect for the legislative uh, process. Um, on other amendments, I support the concerns expressed by Murdo Fraser, Liam Kerr and others. 
about the far-reaching operation of Section 11.9 uh, uh, for the reasons outlined. Uh, the power of ministers uh, under, these, uh, under this section uh, could be far-reaching and um, we uh, could potentially see ministers without any approval or scrutiny by Parliament removing protections relating to the independent, independence of judicial decision-making uh, or decision-making of uh, judicial nature and uh, modifying the Equality Act or the uh, 2006 or the Equality Act 2010. There is provision for um, replacement of any uh, provision amended or modified uh, with an alternative provision, but again, there is real uncertainty as to what that might mean in practice. So, um, again, we feel that, I certainly feel that the powers uh, conferred on ministers under uh, sections 11, 12 and 13 are excessive and also create uncertainty about how they will operate in practice. Um, convener, there are other um, uh, issues that were raised by the Minister in respect of how these powers will operate under Section 13 in, in particular, but uh, these will be dealt in later groupings and I will, will uh, reserve my comments for those uh, discussions in the later groupings. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 125 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Uh, there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 125, there are three votes for, for eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amend, uh, Amendment 17. In the name of Tavish Scott, I read debated Amendment 125. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Uh, move, convener. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. In Amendment 17, there were six votes for, five against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 126 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 125. Jamie Green to move or not move? Uh, at the risk of being accused of further perversion, I will move 126. Okay, the question is, Amendment 126 be agreed, are we all agreed? In which case there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Amendment 126, there were six votes for, five against. That means the amendment is therefore agreed to. I now call Amendment 18 in the name of Tavish Scott. Already debated with Amendment 125. Tavish Scott to move or not move? The question is therefore, is Amendment 18 be agreed? Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 18, that there were five votes for, six against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. I now call Amendment 19 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 125. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move, Commander. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Amendment 19, there were five votes for, six against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. I now call Amendment 127 in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with Amendment 85. Patrick Harvey, to move or not move? Not moved in light of yesterday's discussion. I now call Amendment 128 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 85. Neil Bibby, to move or not move? Uh, similar to Patrick Harvey, not moved in light of uh, last night's discussion. Uh, I now call Amendment 129 in the name of Graeme Simpson, already debated with Amendment 125. I amend members that if Amendment 129 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 130 and 131 under preemption. So Liam Kerr needs to decide, I think, on this occasion, whether he needs to move or not move. Move. <coughs> the question is, though, Amendment 
129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All these in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. In Amendment 129, there were three votes for, eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 130 in the name of Liam Kerr, already debated with Amendment 125. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. The question is, Amendment 130 be agreed or well agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 131 in the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated with Amendment 125. Dean Lockhart to move or not move? Moved. The question is, Amendment 131 be agreed or well agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 131, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 132 in the name of Adam Tompkins. I already debated with Amendment 71. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 132 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 132, there were three votes for, eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. <coughs> I call Amendment 133 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 71. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 133 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 133, three votes for, eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. Therefore, the question is that Section 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. I now call Amendment 20, in the name of Mark Russell, already debated with Amendment 4, Patrick Harvey, to move or not move. Happy to look forward to working further on this towards Stage 3, so not move. I therefore call Amendment 21, in the name of Mark Russell, already debated with Amendment 4, Patrick Harvey, to move or not move. Not moved. <clears throat> I now call Amendment 134, in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 115. And there remain members that if Amendment 134 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 135, 136, 137 and 22 because of... 138. I did say 138. Uh, and, one, and 22 in preemption. Jamie Green, to move or not move? To move. The question, therefore, is that 134 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yeah. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 134, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 135 in the name of Neil Bibby. I already debated with Amendment 115. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 135 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. In which case there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hand. Amendment 35, 135, there were five votes for. Six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 136 in the name of Neil Bibby. Already debated with Amendment 115. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 136 be agreed. Are we all, yes. are we all agreed? No. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Patrick, are you... Just make, I just want to make sure you weren't going to abstain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
six against. Five for six against. Uh, no, uh, but, uh, avoid a tied vote and me having to make a decision. So thank you for clarifying this. Um, amendment 136. Uh, to, uh, votes for five, votes against six. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Comment 137, the name of Neil Bibby. A red debated amendment 115, Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. The question is 137 be agreed to, are all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. <laughs> uh, sorry, all, all those against, please raise their hand. <laughs> On Amendment 137, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment for is therefore not agreed with. I now call Amendment 138 in the name of Neil Bibby. I already debated Amendment 115. And I mem members of Amendment 138 is agreed to. I cannot call Amendment 22. Neil Bibby to move or not move? <laughs> the question is that Amendment 138 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 138, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 22 in the name of Neil Finlay. Already debated Amendment 115. James Kelly to move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise your hand. Those against, please raise your hand. And amendment 22, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Now call Amendment 139. In the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated the Amendment 125. Dean Lockhart, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 139 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Those who are in favour, please raise their hand. Those who are against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 139, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Now call Amendment 23 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 125. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Sorry, all, all those against, please raise your hand. Uh, on Amendment 23, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 140 in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated. Amendment 85, Patrick Harvey to move or not move? Not move. I now call Amendment 141 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated. Amendment 85, Neil Bibby to move or not move? Not moved. Now call Amendment 142 in the name of Jamie Green. Already debated with Amendment 125. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is Amendment 142 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. I call Amendment 143 in the name of Donald Cameron. Already debated Amendment 58. Donald Cameron to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 143 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 43, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 144 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 125. And I remind members that if Amendment 144 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 145 because of preemption. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Not move. I now call Amendment 145 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst. Already debated with Amendment 125. Gordon Lindhurst to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. I call Amendment 146 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Already debated with Amendment 71, Adam Pumpkins to move or not move? Moved. The question is that 
Amendment 146 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Those in favour, please show their, raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. On Amendment 146, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 147 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 71. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Moved. The question is, Amendment 147 be agreed to? Have all agreed? Yes. That means there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 147, there are three votes for, eight against. That means the amendment is not agreed to. The question is that se section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Your opposition is noted. I call in Amendment 148 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 120. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not moved, convener. Okay, I think we shall, in that case we shall suspend for 10 minutes. Thank you, colleagues.
Okay, colleagues, um, I, I now call Amendment 149 in the name of Donald Cameron, which works with amend other amendments as shown in the groupings. Members will note from the groupings that there are a number of preemptions in this group, and I will remind members of the preemption when I call the relevant amendment. Donald Cameron to move Amendment 149 and to speak to all other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, and I uh, duly move uh, my amendment. Um, I only have a single and specific amendment in this section. I think it would be fair to say that it is one of the most difficult and controversial sections in the bill. Um, it relates to the keeping pace power, um, as it's being termed, uh, about the power for um, the government to make provision corresponding to EU law after exit day. Um, I think I would intend to say more about the section uh, as a whole um, in the light of the amendments made when I sum up. But um, in relation to my specific amendment, um, this seeks to add some important riders to the use of these potentially wide-ranging powers uh, in the generality as they're set out in subsection one of the section. Um, my amendment is very much in the theme of other amendments which were made this morning in relation to the checks and balances on executive power and the legislature's role in that. Um, and it seeks to put two conditions on the use of executive power. Uh, the first is that um, regulations made under um, this uh, subsection one of section 13 must be subject to the restrictions and limitations of the Scotland Act. And the reason for that is so that we can ensure that any use of this power is compatible with the devolution settlement as enshrined in the Scotland Act. And I would submit, convener, that that part of my amendment does no more than ensure that the use of this power is fully conversant with the Scotland Act and it provides an overarching protection uh, provided by devolution. Uh, I would not call that littering uh, the act, the, the, the bill rather, with um, obsolete references. In my submission convener, that is enshrining devolution. Uh, secondly, and no less importantly, um, my amendment seeks to put a condition that this parliament gives its consent to the use of these powers. In short, um, that part of my amendment is a simple, even a basic provision, which again only seeks to, do, to, to require that it is this parliament, of which we are all members, uh, that agrees to the powers which ministers may seek to exercise under, the, under this section. This isn't a party political point, it's about the separation of powers between the executive and the legislature. And it's a fundamental uh, point to make, I would say. Um, it applies to ministers of, of whatever political um, stripe, not least given the potential 15-year time frame that could apply to the use of these powers. And it goes to the very nature of what we do here. Uh, ultimately, it's about respecting uh, each other as MSPs and respecting the role of Parliament in scrutinising the power of the executive. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, William Kerr to speak to Amendment 155 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Again, I speak to Amendments 155, 156, 157, 158 and 159 in the name of Graham Simpson. I'm grateful to you for permitting me to speak on his behalf. Looking first at Amendments 155, 156, 157 and 159, these amendments clarify this section so that ministers can make regulations not where EU law is no longer appropriate, but where it is no longer operable. A much tighter and, dare I say, appropriate definition. Uh, this is, again, about how much power is grasped by Scottish ministers. Section 13 sets out the powers for ministers to make regulations, to correspond to EU regulations, provisions or some such, after exit day. And Donald Cameron, we just heard, spoke very persuasively about the importance of this section. Uh, and I, I strongly associate myself with his remarks and in, in what I'm going to say. Uh, subsection 2 of Section 13 sets out the details of what, the, what is entitled to be done, what Scottish ministers may 
and may not do. It sets out that Scottish ministers may omit provisions that link to arrangements that no longer make sense, such as agreements between the UK and EU member states, or that are dependent upon UK membership of the EU. The purpose behind that is sensible, and the merit of the section is therefore clear. But there is a phrase used which is vague throughout. That is that all these things are omitted which no longer exist or are no longer appropriate. No longer appropriate is a vague phrase. It implies a level of judgment on what might constitute appropriateness. And if we import an ability to make a subjective judgment, then it is concerning that there is no equivalent check on the use of that of a minister's judgment. And that must be worrying. We surely should not countenance a situation under which Scottish ministers omit something from regulations on the basis that they simply feel it appropriate. These amendments, therefore, at 155, 156, 157 and 159, by switching appropriate for operable, tighten up the meaning. If something is not operable, it should not be ported in. That is objective, that is correct, that is sensible, and that is why these amendments should be agreed to. Amendment 158 is slightly different, but it makes a similar point. Section 13.2F clarifies that if Scottish ministers use powers under Section 13.1 to make provision, for example, to implement an EU directive, they may confer extra functions or restrictions which they feel it is appropriate to retain. Once again, this is a judgment call, and the risk must be that when we make law, we make law for years and Scottish ministers to come. It must be right to ensure that only functions or restrictions are ported where it is necessary, i.e. imperative or required. It is not right to leave it open to judgment, to subjectivity, to discretion, as use of the word appropriate does. And therefore, I commend Amendment 158 to replace necessary for appropriate. Thank you. Tavish Scott to speak to Amendment 27 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I wanted to speak to 27 and 34 in particular, and I do share uh, Donald Cameron's very opening remarks there in terms of this whole section on keeping pace post-March of uh, next year. And in, arguably in this area, I, I think these two issues are the two I feel most strongly about in terms of uh, improving this uh, bill. Uh, I reflected on, on the need for the administrations across the United Kingdom to cooperate in uh, stage one, uh, which now seems weeks and weeks ago, but I think it's important to remember it was only a week ago. Uh, and I said then, and indeed reflected on that yesterday, that those involved in the rural economy know all too well the importance of a complete UK picture uh, for their business and for their business's success. And this amendment, 27, complements others that I am proposing. It seeks to compel Scottish ministers to consult the other three administrations prior to taking action to keep pace with EU law under Section 13 after uh, exit day. Now, uh, every political party, the uh, Adam Tompkins this morning, uh, the minister's letter last night, has constantly cited the need for framework agreements and, co and coordination and indeed cooperation across the United Kingdom as powers are allocated after exit day. There is no political dissent on that point. So this amendment says that in the event of that every one of the other three administrations specifically asks the Scottish Government not to make a particular regulation to keep up with the, with the with EU law, then that regulation cannot proceed. If Scottish ministers insisted they wanted to do it in the face of that opposition across the UK, uh, then the proposal would have to come through primary legislation. Parliament would look at it in detail. We would consider why the other three administrations were opposed. We would be able, would, we would be able to hear from stakeholder interests, Scottish business and others uh, as mm -hmm. to the proposal and then decide whether or not the government had made the case. So this is not saying the government uh, cannot uh, bring forward in that context a policy proposal, a particular, um, a particular issue that's in the government's view of the time they need to address. It's just saying that the scrutiny of that, the proper uh, parliamentary accountability of that uh, should be in place to allow that to, 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 uh, to happen. We would be able to protect the working of the UK uh, single market from, in effect, unilateral action by any uh, single administration. This amendment uh, represents a federal idea of cooperation, and I make no apologies for strongly believing in that. And it is in contrast to some Conservative amendments which give control of these issues entirely to UK ministers. 
Amendment 29, together with 31, 32 and 33, would mean that the 15 year fifteen year extent of the powers to keep pace with EU law are replaced by a maximum of five years renewed every year thereafter. Now, the Minister has made it clear that he proposes to assess how the powers have been used before they are renewed. I agree and I take that point, but I want to cut down the length of time ministers from any party in the next 15 years. And this is, we are, after all, looking at legislation here that will affect whoever the administration is over, the, over future sessions of this Parliament uh, can rely on these Section 13 powers. On Amendment 34, this proposes to do away with Section 13 in the Bill completely. It shares much with Neil Finlay's Amendment 35, but my amendment goes further and allows Ministers the opportunity to explain their need for further powers. Again, I recognise the point that, that um, the Minister has made in respect of, again, any Minister of any government uh, seeking powers in circumstances that uh, we, we cannot fully envisage. But uh, my proposal in 34 here is, is to ensure that ministers are keen on uh, our provision that they wish, to, uh, they wish to make. It gives them three months to prepare a report on how primary legislation might be used to achieve the same end. In other words, it is a, I, I would argue, a, a way forward in addressing the concerns that I recognise the government and ministers have, but it creates a parliamentary, a proper parliamentary route to properly scrutinise um, uh, what is needed in terms of ministerial powers post March of 2019. And why does that matter? Because we have become obsessed about the language around power grabs. Uh, nothing, nobody looking at Section 13 is under any illusion that that is, that is a, uh, could only really be described as a ministerial seizure of the most extensive powers. This power grab argument works, as some colleagues have mentioned this morning already, both ways. Uh, some could say that for 15 years, if we leave this bill as it is. Ministers, again, of any persuasion can create new laws, abolish old laws, create new quangles, imprison people for up to two years under offences brought to the statute book by regulation and not primary legislation. Now, we've had a bit of a cut at this already, and rightly so, but it is really important uh, that this is carefully, carefully thought through, even in the time constraints uh, we have uh, today. The Minister has said before that he had expected a similar Section 13 to be in the UK Bill. He's also said, let me be uh, right about this, that the Lib Dems would probably like the UK to keep pace with EU legislation. Now, I understand and agree with both those points, Convener, but it can't be done through this truncated emergency procedure. If similar plans had been in the UK Bill, then they would have been subject to the scrutiny of two Houses of Parliament over months and months, not uh, the much shorter period of time that we are having to deal with this Bill here here in Parliament today. This proposal does not have to dovetail with the UK Bill. These propo this proposal within it can be tabled at any point, perhaps even after exit day. Uh, I just argue here that this, is, this part of the Bill is not an emergency. Uh, other parts, uh, the Minister uh, may well have arguments to say demonstrably is, but this is absolutely uh, not. And what uh, Amendment 34 does is to give uh, the Minister, and, and if I may say so more importantly, Parliament, the opportunity to look at the, the, this really important issue of parliamentary scrutiny in the round and over a period of time, not in a considerable uh, rush. It's in a constructive way forward for ministers. They can bring forward a report and justify their plans uh, through the full scrutiny of, the, of this uh, parliament. It's not, this part is not an emergency. Uh, last week in the European Committee, uh, Professor Nicola McEwen, a political, uh, one of our preeminent political scientists, uh, was sensibly warm, in my view, about this route uh, at the committee uh, in terms of uh, Amendment 34 being a sensible way forward in a difficult area of, pub of, of accountability um, and scrutiny. And I hope um, the government might see it in that light. Can I make one final point, Convener, if I may? Um, Neil Finlay's Amendment 42, which I uh, support, is one of three uh, that make, the UK, make sure the UK government and other devolved administrations are consulted before regulations are made under Section 13, the keeping pace power are enacted. And I think that is uh, an important step as well. And on that, uh, with those remarks, I would be happy to move the amendments. Thank you. Uh, Murdo Fraser to speak to Amendment 164 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'd like to speak to my amendments 164, 165, 168, 169, 170, 171, 172 and 173, uh, also James Kelly's amendments 28 and 30, and Tavish Scott's amendments 29, 31 and 32, all of which cover um, the same territory. And the amendments I have put down uh, in this group uh, are complementary and overlapping. 
And what I've tried to do here is present colleagues with a menu of different options to choose from in addressing a concern about the current drafting of section 13 subject sections 7 and 8. And the amendments I've referred to, names of James Kelly and Tavish Scott, have a similar impact. Section 13, as drafted, contains wide powers on Scottish ministers to make provisions in regulations after exit day from the EU. Uh, and we've heard uh, just now from Tavish Scott, and we heard it in the Stage 1 debate, and we heard it in the Stage 2 debate in the Chamber yesterday, concerns from a, a wide uh, range of colleagues uh, across different parties about the extent of these powers and the periods uh, that they last for. Now, these powers to make regulations come under a degree of parliamentary scrutiny. And my primary concern in relation to the amendments I've lodged is that the periods allowed to Scottish ministers to make these regulations are too e extensive. As drafted in the bill, the rights exist for a total period of 15 years after an exit day. An initial period of five years contained in section 13, subsection seven. Scottish ministers can then extend at this period for up to a further five years in section 13, subsection eight, paragraph A, and by a further period of five years in section 13, uh, subsection eight, paragraph B, giving us that total of 15 years from exit day. And it seems to me to be far too extensive a period for ministers in this parliament to have these considerable powers. My amendment 164 seeks to reduce the initial period from five years to four years. Amendment 165, reduces it from five years to three years. James Kelly's Amendment 28 reduces it from five years to two years, and Tavish Scott's Amendment reduces it from five years to one year. Now, my preference would be to see this period reduced to as short a time as possible. My preferred outcome would be to see Amendment 29 in Tavish Scott's name passed. Failing that, I would support Amendment 28 in the name of James Kelly, reducing the initial period to two years, Failing that, I would support Amendment 165 in my name, reducing it to three years. And if all else fails, Convener, I would support Amendment 164 in my name, reducing it to four years. I would then support Amendment 30 in the name of James Kelly, which leaves out Section 8 altogether. In other words, there would be no additional power beyond the initial one that Scottish ministers would be entitled to have these powers. If that is not agreed, that uh, brings me on to my second set of amendments, 168, 169, 170, and Amendment 31 in the name of Tavish Scott. What this does, do, in effect, uh, it, it repeats the same exercise for the initial period, but in relation to the first extension period, currently stated of being up to five years contained in section 13, subsection eight, paragraph A. My preference would be to support Tavish Scott's Amendment 31, reducing that initial period from five years to one year, if that is not agreed by the committee, I would then propose my Amendment 170, uh, in my name reducing the period from five years to two years, then Amendment 169, reducing the period from five years to three years, and failing all that, Amendment 168, in my name, reducing the period from five years to four years. And I then, Convener, go through the same exercise again in relation to the second extension period contained in Section 13, Subsection 8, Paragraph B. Again, my preference would be to support Tavish Scott's Amendment 32, reducing this ex further extension period of five years to one year. In the event this is not acceptable, I then have Amendment 173, reducing it from five years to two years. Amendment 172, reducing it from five years to three years. Failing which, Amendment 171, reducing the period from five years to four years. I'd also support Amendment 33 in the name of Tavish Scott, which puts a total time limit on all extensions of five years. And I also support Amendment 34 in name of Tavish Scott, requiring ministers to produce a report within three months of this bill, uh, obtaining royal assent, which uh, aims to set out the Scottish Government's intentions in this area. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. James Kelly to speak to Amendment 28 and other amendments in the group. Okay, thank you, Convener. Uh, I seek to move amendments 28, 30 and 37 in my name uh, and also, uh, with your permission, amendments 35, 36, 38, 40, 42, 48, 52 and 54 in the name of Neil Finlay. Uh, as other speakers have said, these amend the, the amendments in this group uh, relate to the extension of regulations power 
uh, post-exit day. Uh, and I think this is uh, one of the more problematic areas of the bill because of the extent of powers that have been granted to Scottish ministers. Mr Russell, in speaking to an earlier group, said that he was keen to use the legislation to enhance the powers of the Scottish Parliament. But in relation to Section 13, it seems to me that he's using the legislation to enhance the powers of Scottish ministers. And I agree with much of the points that have been made by Tavi Scott and Murdo Fraser. Um, specifically, Amendment uh, 28 uh, seeks to reduce the, the, the time where regulations are applicable from five years uh, to two years. And subsequent to that, Amendment 30 uh, takes away the, the power of ministers to seek uh, a, a cumulative uh, five-year uh, extensions. Uh, 37 uh, relates to improving the scrutiny on affirmative procedures and makes it more focused. In terms of Neil Finlay's amendments, uh, clearly Amendment 35 takes a step of taking out Section 13 altogether, uh, bearing in mind the fundamental problems that have been ex expressed uh, about this section and the, the powers that it uh, that is granted to ministers. In terms of amendments 36, 38, 40, 42 and 48, they are similar to amendment 37 uh, in the improved scrutiny and they, all, they also introduce uh, proper consultation. Um, so I would uh, move the, the amendments in my name 28, 10 and 37 and 35, 36, 38, 40, 42, 48, 52 and 54 uh, in Neil Finlay's name also. Thank you. Uh, the Minister to speak to Amendment 166 and other amendments <coughs> in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. And I thank members for the amendments they have tabled, which are included in this group. I do acknowledge that this is probably the most controversial section of the bill. Um, I, I know that the obligation is upon the government to indicate why this section should remain within the bill, because there are moves to remove it from the bill, and to indicate how it should operate. And I say at the outset, I'm going to accept some changes to the operation, and I'm willing to accept more changes, because there, uh, there are one set of amendments I want to talk about, which I think could be useful, but to require additional work. But let me just say at the outset, I believe this section is necessary. The same discussion is taking place in Wales, because there is the same section within the bill in Wales. Uh, and quite clearly, there, there will be a concern about continuing uh, regulation and legislation. But I illustrated yesterday in my response to some of the environmental uh, questions, uh, some of the areas in which this would be absolutely vital. Uh, and the issue of regulatory alignment has been much discussed in, in the last few months, particularly with, in, with, in the context of the Northern Irish border. But there are other ways in which regulatory alignment is extremely important. To achieve regulatory alignment, you will require, or the, a parliament require, a power of this nature. Uh, otherwise, it would be incredibly onerous to find it. Uh, the power has to be properly used. It has to be limited. It can be limited in scope, and I want to come on to it in a moment, and it can be limited in time. But without this power, then there will be serious damage to be done to certain Scottish industries. I used agriculture as an ind indication. There's certainly serious environmental damage that could uh, result without this power. So we have to balance, again, as, as the other parts of this bill have shown, we have to balance the requirement for scrutiny, ministerial restraint, ministerial supervision, with the requirement to do something in these exceptional circumstances. Now go back to that, and it, it's important to remember that. There's nothing normal about the way in which the UK government has approached this. There's nothing normal about the process of Brexit. So we have to have some tools that we presently do have. So I accept the principle of scrutiny. I accept the principle of restraint. How do we achieve it? I'm going to make some constructive suggestions, I hope, which will be taken constructively uh, by members in the chamber. Donald Cameron has already spoken to his amendment. Uh, he will not be surprised to hear that I would regard the first part of it as unnecessary, as the restrictions on reserve matters apply anyway under the Scotland Act, something confirmed by Section 13.3 of the Bill. And I also thank Graham Simpson for his amendments, numbers 155 to 159, which I think usefully explore and introduce some of the issues raised by the Keeping Pace Power. I understand that the intention behind those amendments is to make sure that Scottish ministers may only put a keeping pace proposal to Parliament when a higher test is met and in more limited circumstances. Now, I agree with that principle, but the amendments as currently framed uh, wouldn't actually meet that um, test. 
Section two of section subsection 2 of Section 13 confers a limited ability to modify post-withdrawal EU law so it can properly operate in the circumstances of the UK no longer being a member of the EU. In many uses of the keeping pace power, no such modification would be necessary. For example, if we were adding after withdrawal new additives uh, to a list of prohibited foodstuffs, when an EU regulation was similarly updated, then there's likely to be nothing which would need to be adapted. The test for adapting EU law under the keeping pace power is the same as the test that applies to the fixing powers in section 11 and 12. Mr Simpson's amendments would allow those adaptations to be made, would allow EU law provisions to be omitted, and this is crucial, only when part of it is not operable. Now, we don't consider that that's the correct test because very often there will be something in EU law which it would be theoretically possible to maintain, which could be argued and would be argued to be operable, but which it would be inappropriate to keep as a result of EU exit. We wouldn't want to have to put to Parliament regulations which contained inappropriate provisions. Similarly, Mr Simpson's Amendment 158 would bind these regulations to only conferring functions or imposing restrictions which it's necessary, in his word, to retain. The Scottish Government has, as recommended by Mr Simpson's committee, introduced a test of necessity for the fixing powers in the Bill. But this amendment wouldn't work in the same way. Deciding whether to put to Parliament a proposal to make changes to keep pace with EU law involves a question of judgment on the part of Ministers whether to propose regulations and on the part of Parliament whether to accept them. This will involve deciding between different possible approaches and will require a judgment about appropriateness. Now, the government is listening on Section 13, and the intention behind Mr Simpson's amendments, we agree. We want to make changes. We want to address these concerns. But I hope I've pointed out that technically these amendments would have the effect of preventing the Scottish government from adapting the keeping pace proposals that it puts to Parliament to make them work properly. So, whilst I can't support these amendments, I do make an offer to Mr Simpson uh, if he would like to discuss these with the Scottish Government to see if we could adapt his own views and his own amendment to make it work in these circumstances. Now, I'd recognise that similar concerns are raised in the second part of Mr Cameron's first amendment in this, in this group. And I'd also recognise the variety of other amendments in the group raised by other members, including Tavish Scott. I understand the points he makes. There could be implications for the other parts of the UK if Scotland is to up the EU law in a way they don't mirror. But I'd make three points to Mr Scott in response. Once, if there are any international agreements with the EU, either for withdrawal or in the longer term that affect devolved matters, the Scottish Government will be bound by obligations under those agreements in the normal way. Secondly, if there are UK-wide frameworks that affect devolved matters, the Scottish Government will obviously follow its commitments under those frameworks. That's what we're trying to negotiate. But thirdly, beyond international obligations and commitments under frameworks, it is the responsibility of this Parliament to ensure devolved law is effective and the government believes the provision is essential to do that. Now, the future is uncertain, never more so than in matters concerning Brexit. It doesn't, uh, this, we don't su suggest that there's a power to keep in step with EU law for all time. The provision is therefore sunsetted. But reflecting the uncertainty, there needs to be a scope for using the provision and the limitations of the scope in Mr Scott's concerns are met. Now, there was confusion about the nature of the sunsetting provision at stage one. I therefore tabled Government Amendment 166 to clarify our policy. But we recognise the strength of feeling in Section 13 reflected in the amendments. We therefore propose to discuss further with interested parties changes to these provisions with a view to finalising a position on the sunset and the extension of the powers. I want to discuss changes to the sunsetting provisions, changes to scrutiny, and we want to look at to impose a strong reporting requirement. Now, I've indicated in the middle of those, of the, in terms of, of the scrutiny and operation, I'm willing to do so with Mr Simpson, I'll do so with others. Uh, in terms of the reporting requirement, <coughs> then we can look to see if an amendment at stage three from any side of the chamber can be found to do that. But in terms of the sunsetting, uh, I think that I need to go a bit further and uh, show my good faith. Mr. Mr. Fraser has uh, put a menu uh, to the Parliament, uh, which is very good of him. Uh, I'm going to pick two things from the menu. I hope he will accept this as an earnest of good faith. Uh, I will support uh, two of his amendments, uh, Amendment 169 and 173, and I will not move my own Amendment 166. This actually means that, therefore, we have a, a sort of middle point that we've found, 
uh, the extension for three years and subsequent extensions only for two years. Uh, we would have a middle point in there. So we are, I would be meeting uh, what the objections have been to date, that is to find a way to, to limit the use of the powers and to find a higher test than we have, Mr Simpson's point, to take two of the items from the menu here and to continue to discuss uh, the uh, ministerial reporting of powers. I accept this is a broad power. The correct level of scrutiny needs to be considered. I note the proposals from Tabby Scott in a later group which would effectively make any use of the power subject to the enhanced affirmative procedure set out in the bill. Um, and I'm happy to continue to discuss members' concerns. Uh, we will go ahead, I hope on the basis that uh, we are trying to make this better and trying to make this work, but I can't accept that we should simply give up on it because I can envision circumstances where this will be a necessary part of the armory, armory even in the emergency sense that Tavish Scott uh, uh, discounts. I think there are circumstances where this will be absolutely essential. Now, I hope I've made a, a reasonable set of suggestions, which is to accept amendments 169 and 173, not to move 166, to ensure that Mr. Simpson's proposals are taken forward with him and with others as appropriate, so that we can find a way to make this work, but to make it way in a, work in a much more constrained, much more supervised and scrutinised way. Okay, Dean Lockhart to speak to amendment 167 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, my amendment 167 also relates to the so-called keep pace powers in section 13, and I associate myself with comments made by Donald Cameron, Liam Kerr, Murdo Fraser and Tammy Scott, Tabby Scott with respect to the overreach of uh, these uh, powers. As drafted, section 138 envisages that the wide-ranging ministerial powers, including the power of ministers to make any provision that could be made by an Act of Parliament, would be in place for up to a period of 15 years. And I'll come to uh, the Minister's updated proposal in a second. My uh, Amendment 167 occupies a common ground with the amendments proposed by Murdo Fraser and Tavish Scott. And I will still move this amendment as an alternative option to put in place uh, in amongst the other uh, provisions to be uh, 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 considered by the committee and I thank the Minister for his uh, proposals to revise the sunset provisions set out in section 13 and I'm sure the committee will consider these. My uh, amendment if it uh, will be considered would mean that Scottish Ministers can only extend the regulation making powers at the end of the initial five year period by a further period of one, one year but only uh, then if the Scottish Parliament has been consulted in accordance with section 15. Section 15 provides uh, a degree of parliamentary scrutiny, but I also have an amendment uh, which will be discussed at a later grouping, Amendment 191, which would bolster the powers of scrutiny uh, of Parliament in this context. Um, convener, there are now uh, various proposals in front of uh, the committee with respect to the sunset provisions, but I will continue to uh, move my amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the committee wish to speak at this stage? Neil. Neil Finn Bibby and Patrick Harvey. Thank you, convener. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Donald Cam Cameron and others have said, section 13 of the bill is easily the most controversial section of the bill, and as I said in my remarks to the chamber uh, yesterday, um, this group is one of, if not uh, the most important group of amendments that we will debate. This section grants sweeping regulation making powers to Scottish ministers. It would allow the Scottish Government to implement laws in Scotland which correspond to EU law, even if that EU law takes effect after exit day and after we leave the EU. Members will recall there was uncertainty at the committee expressed by Professor Aileen McHarg about whether powers granted by section 13 are a keeping pace power or something that is altogether more difficult to justify. And as I said before in the stage two debate, Professor Alan Page of Dundee University warned the committee that this section amounts to a potentially major surrender by this parliament of its legislative competence. And he also referred to it as a thoroughly bad idea. And there was concerns also raised about um, a democratic deficit. So I have grave reservations about section 13 of the bill. Uh, I do not believe it should be passed, but if this is to pass, 
then we should ensure that the amending stages of the bill enhance parliamentary scrutiny, promote transparency and build checks and balances into this legislation. That is what the amendments in the name of my colleagues James uh, Kelly and Neil Finlay seek to do. Uh, there are also a number of amendments I have heard from Conservative and Liberal Democrat members which we are also prepared to support. We want to ensure that not only proper scrutiny but proper consultation is built in to the bill and we want to ensure that a bill which the Scottish Government have brought forward in order to protect the place of this Parliament in our democracy is not used to sideline or marginalise this Parliament. We want to ensure there is no power grab from this Scottish Parliament to ministers and as it stands there is a power grab from this Parliament to Scottish ministers. So I ask all members to consider uh, supporting the Labour amendments and also consider specifically Amendment 35 in the name of Neil Finlay, which would remove Section 13 from this bill altogether. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Convener. There's no simple way through this. Uh, it's um, a hideously complicated uh, set of decisions that we're being asked to make uh, and uh, a complicated set of, of uh, menu items, uh, as Murdo Fraser described them. I think he's right to, to bring that range of options, but it does make the, the process extremely complicated uh, unless we have provision to vote by single transferable vote. Uh, and, and I don't think Murdo Fraser would like that uh, as much as I might. Um, the minister is quite right that these are not normal times. We're, we're living through an extended constitutional crisis uh, and the um, the number of times I've heard uh, Brexiteers uh, almost describe this process as something as, as simple as, as resigning from the local golf club uh, when in fact what we're talking about is the biggest job of legislative heavy lifting that I can think of anywhere ever. Uh, if, if anyone can come up with an example of, of a process that's more complex uh, that's, that's been undertaken anywhere, then, then I'd, be, uh, I'd be interested in, and dismayed to hear about it. But let's recognise the complexity of the job that we've got ahead of us. Now, I think a balance has to be struck between making that process viable, making it manageable, uh, and maintaining parliamentary control uh, of it. And there is no perfect solution. There's no perfect solution to that. Um, uh, Mike uh, Rumbles in the, in the chamber debate uh, last week appeared to concede, and I apologise if I misheard or misunderstood him, but he did appear to concede that he doesn't think that this whole process can be done with primary legislation alone. Uh, and if, if I understood him correctly, I have to agree with that, and I think Section 13 is regrettably necessary. Uh, but I think that the, there does need to be a... a a change in the balance uh, that's being struck here. Now, it may be that given the way that we're going to have to vote here, uh, the stage two process merely shakes out the range of attitudes uh, and opinions that there are uh, and may leave us in a stronger position uh, to vote at stage three on something that can gain majority support or at least that the majority can live with. But let me just uh, say the uh, run through the amendments that I. Uh, at the moment intend to support, um, which seem to me to strike the right balance. 165 um, moves from five years to three years. Uh, the uh, provision in uh, line 15 of page 12, sorry about this. Uh, yeah, so this is the, um, the, the initial period. No, no regulations made. Uh, after the end of the five years beginning with exit day. I think reducing that to three years is a reasonable compromise. Following that, uh, amendments 31 and 32 uh, would reduce the extensions uh, from uh, their current uh, limit to one year. Uh, and if I'm reading this right, Amendment 33 uh, would limit the total period to five years. So uh, after the, the, the maximum number of extensions allowable, the total period would be five years. Now, it, it seems to me that 
that's a reasonable compromise between what the government is asking for and uh, the, 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 the need to restrain these exceptional powers. I think we all acknowledge that they are exceptional powers being taken. And it also seems to me that if we have that maximum period of five years, there would then be ample time, ample time, if the government, the current government or its successor, who knows what situation we'll be in during that period, would be able to return to Parliament if it believes that a further extension is absolutely unavoidable, there would be ample time to return with new primary legislation setting out additional powers uh, to, to extend uh, what's in the Continuity Act, as it will be by then, assuming it's passed. So that, to me, seems like the right balance to strike. Uh, and um, whether or not we're able to, to reach agreement on that or something like it today, uh, I hope that whatever the result of the, the votes today, members across parties will be willing to work towards something at stage three, which is capable of uh, at least having the majority be able to live with it. Other members indicated a wish to speak at this stage, so Donald Cameron to wind up. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Um, without doubt, in a troubling bill, section 13 is, I think, one of the most troubling provisions. Um, and to be fair to the minister, this was something he acknowledged. I think he described it as the most uh, controversial. And he also referred to the, quote, broad power that it uh, makes provision for. Uh, I'd like to make a few general points in summing up before turning to the detailed um, specifics. Uh, the first point is to say that this uh, power in section 13, the keeping pace power, has no equivalent in the UK bill. Um, we're often told by the government that this bill is drafted in the same vein as the UK bill, that some provisions are identical, uh, and that gives some justification for them, but not here, convener. This is a striking political choice made by the government that goes well beyond the UK bill. Now, the minister is quite open uh, in his antipathy to Brexit. Um, but what I would say is that, without doubt, it is happening. And there is, in fact, sorry. I'm Thank you, convener. Sorry, I'm, it's my enthusiasm getting the better of me. Um, um, there is, in fact, no need, actual need, to keep pace with EU law if we are leaving the uh, EU. Now, there may well be alignment across uh, the UK, across the UK, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, immediately after exit. But it's, there's no actual need for these powers. And that, I think, can be contrasted, convener, with the uh, position in the earlier parts of this Act, which, is, which deal with... Um, carrying over EU law into domestic law, where we, we all accept the need, the requirement, in principle, for that uh, to happen. Uh, whereas here, um, that simply doesn't exist. Now, we may differ in how that continuity of law might happen, and there is a different way of doing it in the continuity bill as there is in the UK bill. But happen, it must. But on the other hand here, it, it is not mandatory. And um, I think the government accept this. If you read their policy memorandum, um, which provides a very lengthy justification for this section, always a warning sign, in my view, but it describes this as useful, uh, a useful method in advance of primary legislation. And the very fact that this is a temporary power, uh, and as the government says, may only be required in the short term, un underlines that. Um, and in my view, with great respect to the minister, he has not given an adequate uh, response to that criticism. This parliament has the ability, in terms of either making primary legislation or supervising secondary legislation, to fill the so-called legislative lacunae that the policy memorandum refers to without the need for a keeping pace power. And we can do what we want within the terms of devolution we can make that primary legislation. Now here I simply disagree with, with Patrick Harvey. Um, if we can pass a, a bill like this in three or four days, then we can certainly le legislate quickly for more specific items such as food additives, which is, is referred to. Uh, just as we can update ambulatory references in the law. So in short, um, I would repeat 
the views of many that I think this is unnecessary and represents uh, an extensive overreach of executive um, power. The specifics, convener, uh, are related to parliamentary, proper parliamentary scrutiny. And I, I should say that I welcome the Minister's constructive approach to the specifics. Um, but I, I think I should draw attention to what the Delegated Powers and Law Committee um, report says here. Um, and they say this is a very significant power and would potentially allow delegated powers to be used for a wide range of circumstances that may otherwise be considered appropriate to be done by primary legislation. The committee queried whether this power was appropriate to the purpose of this particular bill. The committee also queried whether there was the same urgent need for such a power and therefore whether it was appropriate to include such a power within a bill being treated as an emergency bill. So with that in mind, convener, uh, I would briefly turn to the comments of various uh, members and also members of the committee. Um, Liam Kerr spoke about um, uh, his desire for, to see the word operable um, being used rather than no longer appropriate. Uh, and he made, um, I think, potent uh, criticisms that that is better than a subjective judgment on what is appropriate. It's much tighter uh, use, use of the language and it requires an objective judgment. Uh, Tavish Scott um, spoke most strongly, I think, about the primacy of primary legislation. Um, and whilst I might disagree with him about some of the comments, especially on federalism, uh, he said that scrutiny should be in place. Um, and he spoke about proper, the proper parliamentary route uh, to what is required. And uh, made, a, I think, this comment that this could be a ministerial seizure of the most extensive kind, and I would associate myself, um, with, myself with, that, with that comment. He also made the point about emergency legislation um, and that this is not an emergency. It deserves time. And I, I, again, he's, he's absolutely right, convener. Um, when we talk about, as he did, accountability and scrutiny, th these aren't just catchphrases or cliches, they really matter. Um, and in the same vein, Murdo Fraser um, made comments about the wide powers and, and gave a, a suite of different solutions. Um, James Kelly spoke about the problematic nature. Um, Neil Bibby quoted uh, a witness talking about the major surrender here. I think the minister, and I think he is, and I want to be fair to him, should be um, aware of the very serious concerns across the chamber um, uh, that have been expressed by members today uh, about this keeping pace power. And I do welcome his offer uh, in respect of some of the specific amendments, uh, and it will clearly be up to members which, which amendments they, they move. But with that in mind, thank you, convener. Thank you. Now, the process of, obviously, this discussion has been, in terms of the commandments, has been quite complicated. So, too, over the voting process. So, if we take a wee bit of time to go through it, forgive me. Um, but we begin by saying the question is Amendment 149. We agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 149, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 150. In the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated by Amendment 120. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Not move. I now call Amendment 151. In the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 120. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 152 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 120. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 153 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 120. Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 154 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 120. Jamie Green to move or not move? Apologies, can you now give me one second? I'm keeping up. No worries. Uh, is it 154? Just confirm. 154. Uh, not move. Thank you. I now call Amendment 155 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 149. Liam Kerr to move or not move? 
Uh, I'm grateful for the Minister's comments in this regard and will not move uh, Amendment 155. I therefore call Amendment 156 in the name of Graham Simpson. The debated with Amendment 149. William Kerr to move or not move? For the same reason, not moved. I call Amendment 157 in the name of Graham Simpson. The debated with Amendment 149. William Kerr to move or not move? For the same reason, not moved. I call Amendment 158 in the name of Graham Simpson. The debated with Amendment 149. William Kerr to move or not move? For the same reason, not moved. I call Amendment 159 in the name of Graham Simpson. The debated under Amendment 159. 49. Liam Kerr to move or not move? For the same reason, not moved. Call Amendment 160 in the name of Dean Lockhart. Already debated Amendment 125. Liam Dean Lockhart to move or not move? Uh, not moved. I believe my, comment, uh, my colleagues have proposed uh, better amendments. Thank you. Call Amendment 161 in the name of Donald Cameron. Already debated with Amendment 58. Donald Cameron to move or not move? To move. The question is that Amendment 161 be agreed or we all agreed? In that case, there will be a division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 161, there were three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 24 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 125. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Call Amendment 25 in the name of Tavish Scott. They're already debated with Amendment 125. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. Um, all those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 25, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Tavish Scott. Already debated with Amendment 125. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 162 in the name of Donald Cameron. Already debated with Amendment 58. Donald Cameron to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 162 be agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please indicate. Raise their hand. Uh, amendment, amendment 162, there were three votes for, eight against. Amendment 162 is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 163 in the name of Donald Cameron, already debated with Amendment 58. Donald Cameron to move or not move? Yes. Question is that Amendment 163 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Um, there will be a division. All those in the favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 163, vote, three votes for, eight against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 27 in the name of Tavis Scott, already debated with Amendment 149. Tavis Scott to move or not move? Move, Commissioner. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Abs those who wish to abstain. Uh, total votes for three, against six, abstentions two. Uh, Amendment 27, therefore, is not agreed to. Now, I now call Amendment 124, 164, in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 149. Now, I remind members that <coughs> Amendments 164, 165, 129, 28 and 129 are, di 28 and 29 are direct alternatives. That is, they can all be moved and decided on. The text of whichever is the last agreed to is what will appear in the bill. Thank you, Murder Fraser. <laughs> Murder Fraser to move or not move? Uh, move. The question is that Member 164 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. 
All those against, please raise their hand. Amendment under 64, five votes for, six against. Uh, the amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment 165 in the name of Murdo Fraser. I already debated with amendment 149. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 165 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hand. The amendment 165, there were six votes for, five against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I now call amendment 28 in the name of James Kelly, already debated with amendment 149. James Kelly, to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Amendment 28, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 29 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 149. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move, Kavita. The question is, Amendment 29 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Uh, to, uh, I'm on Amendment 29, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 30 in the name of James Kelly, already debated with Amendment 149. Now, I remind members that if Amendment 30 is agreed to, I can't. The amendment 30 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 166, 167, 168, 169. 170, 31, 171, 172, 173, and 32. James Kelly to move or not? Moved. The question is therefore that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 30, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 166 in the name of the Minister already debated with a, Amendment 149. And I remind members that if Amendment 166 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 167, 168, 169, 170, 31, 171, 172, 173, and 32. Minister to move. Not moved. Yep. I call Amendment 167 in the name of Dean Lockhart, already debated with Amendment 149. And I remind members <laughs> that if Amendment 167 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 168. 169, 170, 31, 171, 172, 173, and 32. Dean Lockhart, to move or not move? Move. The question is that 167 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. In which case there will be division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. And those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 167, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendment 168 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 149. And I remind members that Amendments 168, 169, 170 and 31 are direct alternatives. Murdo Fraser, to move or not move? I can mean in view of what the Minister said earlier and in expectation of satisfaction further down the list, I will not move this one. Okay. Still a little bit through it, yeah. 
I call Amendment 169, the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 149. Mr Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Uh, yes, moved. Yeah. The question is that Amendment 169 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Well, okay, we're agreed. I call Amendment 170 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already de de debated with Amendment 149. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 170 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 170, there are five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Now, now call Amendment 31 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 149. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 31, there were six votes for, five against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. There we go. There we go. Yes. I now call Amendment 171 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with Amendment 149. And I remind members that amendments 171, 172, 173 and 32 are direct alternatives. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Not move. I call, I call amendment 172 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with amendment 149. Murdo Fraser to move or not move? Not moved. I call amendment 173 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with amendment 149. Mr. Fraser, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 173 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 149. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Uh, move, Commissioner. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, all those in favour, please raise their hand. Sorry, there will be division. All those in favour, please raise your hand. All those against, please raise your hand. On Amendment 32, there were six for and five against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. Now call Amendment 33 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 149. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 33, there were six votes for, five against. The amendment is therefore agreed to. Now we call Amendment 34 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 149. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. All, in favor, all those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. On Amendment 34, um, there were five votes for, six against. That means that Amendment is not agreed to. I now call Amendment 35 in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with Amendment 149. James Kelly to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to, or are we all agreed? Yes. Division. No? Division. division. There will be division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please move their hand. raise their hand. On Amendment 35, there were five votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. <coughs> right, I now call Amendment 174 in the name of Ross Greer, grouped with, grouped with Amendments 187. Ross Greer to move Amendment 107. Yeah. No, because we had, we had a vote on that immediately before that, and we'd already agreed it in the vote, and Thank therefore you. we don't need to agree it a second time. Thank you.
Thank you for raising that point of clarification. I'd got to uh, saying, Ros oh, I'll start that again, I think, just for the sake of uh, accuracy. I call Amendment 174 in the name of Ross Greer, grouped with Amendment 187. Ross Greer to move Amendment 174 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Glad to speak to Amendments 174 and 187. The vast majority of changes anticipated as needing made as a result of this process are addressed in Sections 11 through 13 of the Bill, namely the power to correct deficiencies in EU law, comply with international obligations and to keep pace with legal developments in the EU after Britain's exit day. As it stands, the Continuity Bill currently sets out in Section 14 a list of changes to be made through the affirmative procedure uh, and through the affirmative with additional consultation, the super affirmative. All other changes are left to the negative procedure. Amendments 174 and 187 in my name would grant the Scottish Parliament the power to decide the appropriate scrutiny procedures instead. At its core, this amendment is about asserting the role of Parliament alongside that of government. This approach is modelled on the Sifting Committee Amendment introduced to the UK Government's Withdrawal Bill by the Conservative Chair of the Commons Procedures Committee, which was agreed, uh, though obviously contains some differences. Uh, this will provide our committees with the power to decide on the appropriate procedure, negative, affirmative, super affirmative, to be used for statutory instruments during this process. Some speakers in yesterday's debate seem to indicate that they understood this amendment as creating a new sifting committee, which Neil Finlay kindly volunteered me for. Uh, to be clear, uh, I believe we should empower the, the relevant subject committees of the Parliament as a practical way to manage workload, but ultimately the specific arrangements would be a matter for Parliament through the Standards and Procedures Committee. They're an issue of standing orders. The amendment obliges ministers to lay all statutory instruments as a draft for the relevant committee to consider. The committee then takes 15 days to make a recommendation, which is binding on ministers. It is that impairment of Parliament rather than inappropriate over impairment of ministers, which this amendment sets out to achieve. Um, it's essential to assert through the bill itself the need for Parliament rather than government to be in the driving seat and to prevent ourselves from being tied down by prescriptive lists during an unpredictable process. To avoid, for example, potentially significant issues being dealt with through negative procedure because we did not adequately, adequately predict a type of change to be included in the list which requires affirmative procedure and thus have an unsatisfactory level of parliamentary scrutiny. These amendments are in keeping with the sentiments that the Minister and all other parties throughout this process uh, have outlined so far, and I hope that they are agreeable to the committee. Is there any other member of the committee wishes to speak at this stage? Neil. Thank you, Convener. I welcome amendments 174 and 187 from Ross Greer on the basis that any additional scrutiny in relation to the extensive new powers this bill grants to Scottish Ministers must be given the committee's fullest consideration. The amendments in this group are not the only amendments which seek to enhance scrutiny, but my understanding is these amendments in this group would not preempt any other amendments the committee will consider later. This grouping therefore presents the committee with an opportunity to agree to a further process for scrutiny of the regulation, making powers which sections 11, 12 and 13 of the bill grant to Scottish ministers. That includes requiring the Scottish Government to lay a statement before Parliament, setting out their own views on appropriate method of scrutiny and making it a condition that a committee of the Parliament can recommend an appropriate method of scrutiny. To be clear, we do not believe that Ross Greer's amendments alone provide enough additional scrutiny given the scale of the new powers that ministers will acquire. We do, however, believe these amendments are a useful addition to the bill and minded to support them. Any other members? Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Convener. Uh, can I uh, also welcome uh, these amendments from Ross Greer and uh, commend him on his patience for sitting through uh, not just today's session, but last night's, uh, much of last night's as well, uh, waiting for us to, to reach this group. Uh, I think there's been some good constructive discussion uh, outside of the formal committee process when, when members across parties have been uh, talking about these issues. There's there's been a, a good constructive discussion around ways of enhancing and scaling up the scrutiny powers uh, of the Parliament. This, I think, is an important way of achieving that and critically of placing the, the responsibility to decide how that should happen with Parliament itself. Uh, I think that uh, it's worth uh, reinforcing that uh, Clause 4 of the amendment uh, says that uh, uh, such of its committees as the Parliament may determine has made a recommendation. So it would be for this Parliament to decide how it wishes to go about the process of deciding what recommendations to offer. Uh, I know that some have suggested uh, a new sifting committee, uh, as uh, Ross Greer mentioned. Others have suggested uh, our existing subject committees, 
which I think would also be appropriate. Others have suggested either the existing DPLR committee or an enhanced DPLR committee. Of course, it's within the, uh, the, the scope of, of choices that we could make a, as a parliament uh, to expand the remit of that committee or to increase the size of it if, the, if we thought that was uh, a, an important step to make as well to ensure that it had the capacity to undertake this work. All of these options are compatible with the amendment as has been lodged and it would be for Parliament to decide what the appropriate course of action was. Now, obviously, we'll listen to what the Minister has to say uh, about this, uh, and we'll take his, his comments seriously. Um, if he believes that uh, a different approach uh, is necessary, I, I suspect everybody would be willing to debate that at stage three, but my instinct at this point is that we should pass this amendment, uh, and if the Government wishes to tweak or adjust uh, the amended bill, uh, that will be something that I hope everybody will be able to discuss in a constructive spirit. Uh, I think we'll be in a stronger position to do that if this amendment has been passed. Adam Tompkins. Um, I don't say this very often, convener, perhaps it's because he's sitting on what is customarily the Tory front bench, but I agree with what Patrick Harvey just had to say. Um, uh, I hope that doesn't spoil things. Here, but I'll, I'll try not to. I'm, well, I, I agree with that too. You should try not to. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I, the only thing I want to uh, say, um, Kavina, um, is that even if the minister, from whom we've not yet heard with regard to this group, um, wants to make arguments that there is some kind of technical deficiency uh, in, in, in these amendments, I would respectfully urge Mr Greer to press them to a vote now so that we can revisit them at stage three rather than withdraw them at this point uh, in the hope that the government might find time at stage three to, to revisit these issues. I think it's incredibly important that we do everything that we can at this stage to ensure that effective parliamentary scrutiny is maximized uh, with regard to the powers um, uh, legislated for um, in, this, um, uh, in this bill. Uh, and for those reasons, the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the um, amendments in this group. Any yeah, other members indicated a wish to contribute, Minister? Thank you, um, convener. Um, I, I say at the outset I want to agree to these amendments um, and I will not oppose these amendments here and now. Uh, I do think, uh, and this is not a, an excuse, and, 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 and Ross Greer knows this because I've had a conversation with him about it, I do think there are issues in the amendment that require change. And I also think they do preempt a, the work that is being done with the Parliament authorities, which we uh, were very happy to instigate, but which is taking place in great detail, to ensure that this is done in the best possible way. Uh, the technical issues I have, amongst others, is that I think that the 15 days issue is problematic in terms of the flexibility and the ability of the Parliament to plan its procedures. I also think that the Delegated Powers Committee is not only the right place for this to happen, but probably needs to be enhanced to allow it to happen. And there are some issues with the powers of the Delegated Powers Committee that would also need to be adjusted. But uh, those, are, those are issues which we can address. One of the uh, issues that arises in, a, 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 in, in legislation like this is that we have to uh, balance between what we think is absolutely perfect and what we think will be able to work, because that's what members want to work. Uh, the best is often the enemy of the good, if I may use that uh, uh, platonic remark. And therefore, I'm happy to uh, endorse what Ross Greer is trying to do, to ask him to work with us over the next few days to get some amendments to this. It's actually going to <coughs> make it work properly, and then we'll be in a position to have a, 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 a process that is better than the process in the bill. Can I make one final uh, observation, however? I am still very keen on a criteria-driven process. I think it's really important that we have criteria by which we can judge our decisions. We may wish on occasions to, to, to reach those criteria. There may be special circumstances in which we do so. But if we understand the criteria that we apply, whether we, when, when we are choosing whether it's affirmative or super affirmative or, or negative, then we'll be in much firmer ground when we come to the difficult decisions, a decision that could go either way. Um, and therefore, I would want to see within this process a continuation of the criteria-driven uh, 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 
uh, system that we are trying to put into the bill. But with that, uh, I'm, I'm therefore relaxed about its passage. I, uh, I don't think this needs to be forced to a, a division. Uh, that will be up to individual members. Um, and we can then uh, do our best to undertake some uh, changes to this. And if uh, Ross Greer will make a commitment to do so, I make that commitment, and then we can move on. Ross Greer to wind up. Happy to make that commitment to the Minister. Welcome the appetite from the committee. I think we can press on this and make any necessary technical amendments at stage three. Okay, the question therefore is that amendment 174 be agreed to or well agreed? Well, there will be a division. So all those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. All those who are abstaining, please raise their hand. <coughs> amendment 174, there were six votes for, there were zero against, there were five abstentions. Amendment 174 is there agreed, therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 36 in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with Amendment 149. And I remind members that if Amendment 36 is agreed to, I cannot call uh, Amendment 37. James Kelly, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to, are we all agreed? There will be a division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Sorry. Amendment 36, there were five votes for, six against, and therefore the amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 37 in the name of James Kelly, already debated with Amendment 149. James Kelly, to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 37 be agreed or well agreed. Then in that case, there will be division. All those in favour, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Um, and Amendment 37, there were five votes for, six against, and therefore the amendment is not agreed to. Now, having reached this stage and given the time we're at, it's my intention to suspend and we'll reconvene at 6.30 in the, in the chamber to complete our stage two consideration subject to further discussion with the parliamentary authorities and the clerk will confirm by email the exact arrangements later on the day in. So at, at this stage, I suspend this meeting of the committee.